Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Jerry Wallach, my partner in crime, as always, Vasily Giannarakos, my friend. How are you? I'm doing really well, Yariv. Obviously, uh, a lot of big news um, from a Flyer standpoint since the last time we uh, talked. Um, the Flyers were able to get Ivan uh, Fedotov out of Russia uh, after everything that's occurred over the last few years. Uh, so just a quick little statement on that. I think it really exemplifies how Briere uh, and the team tried to kind of explore all options in an effort to better the team. He's just navigated the Gautier situation, Hart situation, Fedotov situation. Um in a masterful manner as a rookie GM. So with that, I mean, and all that news, I'm doing really well. Uh, we have a really great guest today uh, that everybody's super excited about. Has been asking, asking us to have him back on to discuss, you know, a ton of flyer stuff. So I'm doing great. Uh, I hope you're doing great as well, Yareev. How's it going, buddy? I appreciate it, man. Good intro. Um, yeah, doing well, doing well, and it's super excited. And uh, like like you said, definitely, we had a bunch of requests immediately. Uh, we always do, and we will have you on more often. Uh, welcome back to the show, the draft analyst, Steve Cornianos. How you doing, buddy? Outstanding, guys. Always a pleasure. Yeah, dude. We're really excited. Um, had this, you know, I was kind of playing around when to do this, and I thought, you know, the Flyers were kind of losing at the time. It was like a very stressful time. So I was like, why don't we take everybody's mind a little bit off of, you know, this playoff run, it's all we're talking about anyway. Let's reflect on the future, you know? And I know that there's nobody better to talk to than you about it. So uh, I'm pretty pumped for this episode. And we'll talk a little bit of Flyers' recent stuff too. Um, but we'll, we'll majority of the show will be prospects today. Um, before we get started, just want to remind everybody to please like, subscribe, hit the share button. Or I'm sorry, share our stuff out if you can. Hit the notification bell uh, to be notified. Follow us on iTunes, on Spotify, and give us a rating there as well. It's a humongous help. And a shout-out to our sponsor, Jim Steaks. Uh, we'll be back open on May 1st. Uh, make sure to get yourself a cheesesteak and Summit Public Adjusters. Uh, you can reach them at 215-752-0560. Okay, before I get started, I just want to give a shout out to my buddy Jay Lubes, uh, one of my best friends. He does all the audio, all of our intro music, and he just hit me up last night and was like, hey, I made you a new song. Might make you another new one, but this episode has a new intro song, so I just want to say thank you to him. Um, I really, really like this one, so I'm excited about that. So thank you, Lubes, if you're listening. Really appreciate it, buddy. Um, okay. And uh, let's get into topics. Uh, we'll start with flyer stuff, and then we'll get into prospect. We'll keep it pretty high level. Um, but obviously, there was kind of the big news that Vasily already mentioned with Ivan Fedotov. Uh, the Flyers are kind of coming down to this playoff race, and then we have Tortorella's uh, presser. So just, you know, it's coming down to the wire with the playoffs. Flyers have six games remaining. Their competition has game in hand. They're still in a spot right now, but if things break the wrong way and they don't win some games, they might find themselves outside of it. Um, but still in third place, I think the the goal really is to hold either wild card or third place. Either or really does not matter for this team. The level of competition almost is irrelevant. All of the teams at the top are good. Outside of Florida, who's struggling a little bit right now, but let's be honest, um, they're still a top team in the league. Um, so it's interesting. We did have a press conference today. Um, two of the things that I'll take away, and, and Vasily, I'll go to you first, and then uh, Steve will let you comment on on Torts' presser, but two things to really take away. Coots got injured in that game against the Islanders, a crucial overtime loss uh, for the team. Um, he is now listed as day-to-day. -day. He was not at practice. Neither were some other veterans as well. Uh, it was an optional practice today. Um, we don't know what his status is. It didn't look good. He might be out for the remainder of the season, potentially the playoffs as well. Um, but we'll wish for the best. It didn't look good. Uh, and then the other thing uh, really to point out is that, you know, Tortorella, it was a, it was a great press conference. You guys should listen to it. He did kind of go in full detail. He was open. You know, he's not always so open. Um, but, you know, the biggest takeaway for me was just taking ownership about talking about preparing the team for the playoffs, for this level of intensity where everything ratched up. You know, we talk about how important the playoffs are for this team's evolution, even playing in these games alone for these guys to understand how they need to ratchet everything up and that every game, you know, there are just there's no quit and there's no 
loss of focus that can be had here at the end of the season. Um, and I think it's overall, it's a great thing. It's, it's funny how he was being mocked uh, for his initial call out of the team after the Islanders game, though I think it was completely justified. Um, but then you see the uh, the way he was open and willing to take ownership on his own too. Probably part of the conversations that we never really get to see is how Tortorella really is. I doubt he's always just in there bashing everybody around him. Um, like some people try to pretend like he is. Um, but I thought it was really great, uh, you know, uh, conversation in general and that he was really open with people. Um, and the only downside I thought was really just not getting an update on Coots. Uh, Vasil, we'll go to you first. What are, what are your thoughts about, you can reference the game too, but what are your thoughts about the presser? Um, very candid press conference, obviously from John Tortorella. Like you usually don't hear him uh, this open and kind of this upfront in terms of the tactics and what he's trying to do to, to motivate the team. Uh, for me, uh, at least in terms of the Islanders game, it seems as though he obviously gets Fedotov in there to try to motivate the team um, after a lackluster first period. And then the team doesn't respond and allows the Islanders to get 17 shots um, on net, essentially on a, on a rookie first timer in the NHL. And that's, I think where the anger comes from that, like, where's the intensity uh, from a team in a playoff like atmosphere, playoff like situation. Uh, and I, what I really think is interesting is that Tortorella kind of acknowledging that maybe the team wasn't ready for uh, these types of games or wasn't actually prepared um, to potentially play in this type of playoff like atmosphere. And he kind of takes some accountability there on his end. So I do have a, the, the full quote here, so I'll read it out. Um, he states, it comes down to, oh, they're going to quit on me. It follows me around. And so be it. If a player is going to quit on me or players are going to quit on me because I'm trying to make them better people or better athletes, you've got the wrong damn coach here and you've got the wrong damn people here. My job as a coach, I'm going to push athletes. I try to stay away from um, these other things. I have other things on my mind that I don't uh, give the media. I was in control the other night. What I said about the team I meant. And quite honestly, when I watch the tape now, I'm more concerned than just the second period because of I'm so proud of where the team has gotten. I guess now the narrative out there is I've heard from other people is they're a young team. They're not supposed to be here. That's bullshit. We're here. We're here. Face it and let's be better. And I don't think we're ready to be better right now. And that's my problem uh, with the team. And it's my job. I have not done a good enough job to get them over the hump. I have not done a good enough job to make them understand we have to be different now. We have to be at a different level. That's the frustration with me and my frustration with the team. If people can't handle it, then so be it. Yeah, I love so that I, quote. I, yeah, I, it's, I, a really, it's a really good quote, but... Like I've seen national media, for example, here in Toronto, um, cover what happened in the press conference um, the other day, essentially stating, you know, Torrell's calling the team out. He's calling all his players out, but it's never on torts, right? It's never Tortorella's fault. Um, but I thought it was interesting that in this press conference, he's kind of taking full accountability for the team not being prepared to play against the Islanders and against even, you know, Chicago, Montreal and, and such crucial critical games. Um, so I think that's definitely a refreshing aspect because it's true. You don't always see him take that accountability in, in the media and the press, but I'm sure it's something that's done behind closed doors um, when those conversations are had between player and coach. But you're not always going to see and, and hear all of those you know um scenarios all those situations what what did you think steve just kind of on on that quote on the comments from from tortorello he shouldn't be blaming himself at all because this team was terrible two years ago he comes in and they're on pace to have their best season since 2019 20 they've approved uh, they've improved in nearly every category except the power play but remember he inherited a horrible power play so one thing that i'm waiting for i'm waiting for keith jones and daniel briere to step up and say, hey, listen, we gave torts very little. They were not busy in the offseason. They were not busy at the deadline. They actually sold right at the deadline. So the team got worse from a roster standpoint, but they improved in the standings. And they're in a position where they're actually on the verge of potentially making the playoffs, which is which which was inconceivable uh in, in you know in during the summer. So I think the issue with the Flyers is very clear cut. It's a skill issue. It's a personnel issue. Like the players are good, but it seems like with if you put any of these players on any other team, a uh, contending team, you're looking at a third line, a second line, or at best. 
There's no star power on the blue line. There's no star power in goal. They thought they had star power in goal, and, and we all know what happened to Carter Hart. So this is like a, a patchwork kind of a team. Yeah, the, the effort against the Islanders was uh, uh, that second period was one of the worst second periods I think I've seen, I've seen any team have. And of course, it was at home in a must win game. So I understand what Torch is doing. Uh, the, the national media has this obsession with him like 30 years ago, 40, 50, 70 years ago. This is a nothing burger, okay? A yeah. coach doing whatever he can to motivate his players. He's going to bench popular guys. He's going to send the message the way he sends it. Um, this obsession with him and everything he says, I, I don't know. I don't really, I never really bought into it. Uh, but I, I think that at the, the end of the day, that if the Flyers needed extra motivation from their, let's say, coach by calling them out or let's say, you know, or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, he's running out of options. They don't have a lot of time left. So you could only change fourth lines and bottom pairing so much. You could only, you know, shuffle the lines around so much or change a goalie like we saw against the Islanders. On, in, in the beginning, it looked like it was going to pay off. And, and I thought that Fedotov was great. And they still got a point out of it. They had no business getting a point in that game. Yeah. And Fedotov, uh, in that second period, anything he touched, the crowd, the crowd was cheering him. But he was making quality saves. He stopped Barzell. I think the first real save he made was a Barzell breakaway from the blue line in. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough position to be in. We, we got to keep things in perspective, though. This team was not supposed to be here. All right? And there's, there are a lot of teams who just haven't seized the opportunity to overtake the Flyers. In reality, the Eastern Conference in the past, at least, has always had like seven or eight hundred point teams. That is not the case this year. Eastern Conference is not very good. So with all the losing the Flyers are doing, you're also having other teams lose as well. Uh, and that's why you have this massive bubble. And I think people are getting a little bit more stressed out. So I don't know, maybe from an as an outsider's perspective, I, I think this season is a big win regardless uh, but as far as Tortorella's tactics, the way he tries to motivate his guys, uh, he probably has like a playbook. If he doesn't keep it on his desk, it's in his head. And and this is one of them. Like it's it's like a last resort yeah. where calling out your guys publicly, see how they respond. But at the same time, I don't think the personnel is capable of, you know, I, I don't say in, they're incapable because they've played well enough up to this point. But with the injuries and the, you know, the, 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 some of the underperformances we've seen, the youth, uh, the inexperience, uh, which is a big part of it, um, it's not looking good. But then again, we'll have to wait and see in these final, whatever it is, five or six games. Yeah, I think, Steve, like the main thing is Tortorella probably realizes all those factors that, hey, there's injuries a lot of youth on this team that firstly haven't been in these big games before. So that's a tough thing as a young player to experience for, for, for the first time and kind of understand what the intensity is going to be like, but at least from my perspective, and it's kind of puzzling to me that the national media and even, you know, some of the local Philly media doesn't see it as well, that this is purely like a motivating factor from John Tortorella, what he's doing here, um, calling his team out, calling that second period out. He's trying to motivate these players to say, hey, like if we want to capitalize on all we've done this season and not let it just be a, a feel good type of story and actually make the playoffs here, like we need to raise our level and it can't be anywhere close to what it was in that second period, right? It has to be miles above that in order, you know, for the team to actually kind of get out of this five game losing streak here scrape some points together, uh, make the playoffs. So that's the way I look at it. It's a, it's using that as a motivating tool to try to get these players to react and, and play better in the future. Is it going to work? Who knows? But I mean, that's Tortorella, right? He, he's been using these types of tools, these types of factors to motivate players uh, the last 20 years as a coach. It's nothing new from him, really. Yeah. No, yeah I and it, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no, please. Now, I was going to say the uh, the other thing about especially the Islander game and really the, this 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 downturn period is that uh, the players are making the mistakes like a lot of these these the issues are self-inflicted. It's not like Tortorella is not, you know, employing uh, a, a better defense or a better offense or his schemes like, you know, you're seeing Konechny and even Forster 
made like a pretty bad giveaway that led to one of the goals uh, or it was like, I think it led to the breakaway. Um, I forgot. But the point is that like the players have to be accountable. Uh, they have to be in this instance. Uh, so I know that the coaches, like Vasily said, is just trying to deflect a little bit. Um, but I, I, I think it really does boil down to talent. And, and I, I really do want to hear what Jones and Briere have to say. Like, you know, let's say we'll have to wait until the season ending presser, whether it's after a playoff loss, uh, whether it's after not making the playoffs and before the lottery, uh, we'll see. But, I, I, you know, the, the guy could only really do so much with what he's been given. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. And it's definitely the players. I mean, that that's the thing. It's like when you look at, like you said, you know, where the team was to where they are today, Torts has done his job. Like, I I am very, to be honest with you, it's, I'm not like annoyed at fans. I'm more like annoyed with like kind of how media handles this, where they pretend like they're subject matter experts on coaching a hockey team all of a sudden, and that they know the right buttons to push. But it's like, if you look at majority of the best coaches in the league, they're not always Mr. Nice Guy. Like that is not- Roddy Bowman. <laughs> look at yeah. Cooper. I mean, how many times did he lose it on his team this year? And they finally turned it around here at the end after adding some talent. Yeah, they had some injuries, but it's like, it just happens all the time, right? Like, yeah. like you said, Scotty Bowman. It's like the arguably the best coach in NHL history, right? It's I don't expect them to be nice. I expect them to be motivators and to keep the team to a really high standard. And I think that Tortorella has done that. He has already elevated this team standard. He's doing it again here right now. I love what he said. I love that he called out we're not supposed to be here. And I hear a lot of people saying that. And you're absolutely right, Steve. You know, like the division has not been good, especially Metro division has not been very good this year. A lot of teams have underperformed. And yet those teams, I feel like people are like, oh, well, those teams should be better, but the Flyers should be worse. It's like, no, everybody is exactly where they're supposed to be, in my opinion. It's like those teams weren't as good as you thought they were for various reasons, whether it be injuries or just youth, in my case, um, like with New Jersey, right? It's a combination of both. They're a young team and they lost their top defender at the beginning of the year, right? It's like, that's exactly where you're supposed to be. The Flyers also lost Coots for an entire year last year. He's recovering. He's not the same player in the second half of this year. Atkinson has been almost completely irrelevant in the second half of the year, not even playing to NHL standards. You know, we lost our top goaltender. Like you were saying, it's like, Everybody is where they're trade away to be. your number one defenseman, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, trading Sean Walker by the metrics, I believe, was had the best metrics on the team, if I remember correctly, yeah. right? Like underlying look, offensive and defensive metrics. And, and I reacted to that accordingly, and I knew I was kind of in an isolation where I was kind of weighing, I was saying, unless they get a first round pick, I'm not moving Walker because I'd rather make the playoffs and then you know, then get like a late second round pick, you know, which can be like equivalent to a third in a lot of ways. But the fact they got a first round pick, I was like, okay, I'm satisfied with that. But I knew what was going to happen, right? They already were missing bodies. It's like, this is kind of is what it is. I am happy with what Tortorella has done. I'm happy with the way he's handling things. I don't need him to be perfect. I don't need him to always say the right thing. I need him to motivate the team. And I will say this, and for those who have short memories, like we used to constantly complain that this team was out hustled. That their motivation. I, I remember, Steve, when you first started coming on this podcast, that was one of the first things we talked about, if I remember correctly. It was the tiny Flyers, heart syndrome, is what I called it. Yeah. Well, I remember those games where, like, they I remember that loss to to um New York, the, where, the nine goal, yeah, nine, yeah. Not, the 10 nothing. It, or something. it was yeah. it, that was you will never see that under torts, you know, like, yeah, you saw like their bad performance against Chicago, it wasn't that bad. Like, their bottom is not the same bottom anymore. And that means the ceiling needs to be raised, too. And I don't have a problem with it. Like, push them. Push them hard. They're, if they don't make it, they're going to have a long off season anyway, you know? So, I would say p push them hard. The goal is to play at least four games in the playoffs. You know, if they get swept, it is what it is. Nobody expects them to win the Stanley Cup. But to get that experience is everything. And I, um, I totally agree. So, we brought up Fedotov. And I'm going to go to you first, Steve, and then Vasily, I'll let you comment. But as somebody who's followed Fedotov for a while, who I, I know that you've watched him. Now, he came into this game. I did have relatively high expectations. We don't know. There's not a big scouting report on him now, right? He's kind of coming in, um, being an unknown quantity. But I, I think just his poise, uh, outside of his size, which is not teachable, um, I think there seems to be a lot of value there. And the Flyers 
might be actually at least pretty set with having a fedotov Airson combination going into next year because we were confused on what would be the backup because obviously Felix Sandstrom is probably at the end of his rope here, um, and Peterson's really just here because of his contract. Um, and uh, I'm pretty satisfied with that. And we imagine, Vasily and I were both assuming, we don't really know, that he's going to play the next game against Buffalo. Um, they're going to give Arison maybe ex- a little extra time off and then play Arison against Columbus, and there are two back-to-back games coming. Um, but what, what were your expectations of Fedotov? Were you surprised by his performance? Um, and what, what do you, how do you kind of see him? Because we haven't talked too much about him at all over the, the past year or so. Well, I, I like that you brought up the term poise because the thing about Fedotov is he's played in some of the biggest games that you could play outside of the NHL. Uh, we're talking about the KHL finals, game sevens against, you know, AHL plus caliber lineups, uh, you know. And so I don't care what league you play in. A game seven is a game seven. If you're playing little league softball or you're playing basketball or uh, you go into uh, a do or die game, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you to succeed. And, and watching him in Russia, he doesn't get rattled. He's he's very, he's a calm guy. He doesn't really talk a whole lot. He's not, let's say, that demonstrative. Uh, he his actions in the in the crease uh, really kind of speak for himself. He's not like like a hex stall with like he's got like these little mannerisms or anything like that, you know. And so it's definitely weird seeing a six foot six or whatever he is guy like seven and a half. A yeah, six apparently. seven and a half. And you know he had the he had the the, the, the plain white uh, mask, so it was a, had like an old school feel to it. Um, and I, I was really watching him. Uh, his movements inside the crease and he looked like a very confident young man. He yeah. he looked like he was not, he didn't, it's like, he didn't understand the stakes. He didn't understand who he was playing against. He probably didn't have much of a scan report on anything, but he totally guessed right on Barzell on the breakaway. And um, what I liked was the clearing attempt. It was beautiful. Oh yeah. The stick work, you know, and speaking of Hegstall. So, uh, I'm not going to go and, and and say that goalie issues solved because I really think the issue with Urson was the poor kid was probably just tired. Yeah. Uh, he went from being the number one in Lehigh Valley last year and helping them turn things around. And now he's thrust into a very difficult situation in Philadelphia where he has to become not just the number one, but a number one without really anybody pushing him. And so um, I think I, I said when they signed him at Asiska, I said that I think at worst, this guy's going to be a number one or a backup in Lehigh Valley. Like he's not going to go to Reading. He's not going to like, you know, go to like some other European league and stay there and be on loan. Like the, the intent was to bring him over and play him uh, to get him to play in the NHL. And, and look at all the other Russian goalies who followed that same career path to an extent, you know, draft him in, in, in the, like the mid 2010s. You know, let him marinate in the KHL, play big games, play in the international stage, and then boom, they show up in the NHL, and everyone's like, "Where'd this guy come from?" We're like, well, if you paid attention, he's definitely been one of the best goalies uh, in uh, outside the NHL, and and that's the same situation with Kolosov, uh, the the kid they just came over from Minsk. So uh, it's going to be a, a a competition, definitely. Uh, but I think that you know we've seen these goalies late season runs. You know, I, I'll date myself and say Sean Burke in 88. We had the Hamburglar not too long ago, right, with Ottawa. Yeah. Uh, Binnington to an Bennington, extent. Yeah. Uh, Michael I don't want to Layton. say that they are. Yeah, like like they, yeah, uh, with uh, the Flyers, right, in yeah. 2010. Alex Lyon, too, I would say. Yeah, like, so it's it, these these guys, it's just the nature of the position. It's like a backup quarterback uh, filling in or, uh, you know, a starting pitcher from the minors where, like, they come in like, where these guys come from? So, uh, the, and the two goals he gave up weren't really his fault. Like one of them was a deflection, uh, after he stopped, like he made like 10 really good saves and then, you know, the overtime winner, I mean, that was a bad turnover by frost and it was a basically wide open net to slam home. So yeah, I agree. If, if, if Torch is going to go put him, uh, start him in the next game, not only, like you said, give Urson a rest, but. You know, it's interesting. It's I'm I'm glad everything it like we we've we've kind of like have closure on the whole kidnapping in Russia situation. <laughs> yeah, it's full circle, right? Remember, we were all worried, like, oh, he's yeah. gonna go to war in Ukraine. It's and a real like, fascinating and he's like, gonna you know be a prisoner of war and like all this. I'm like, no, I mean he's okay now. He's in Philly. 
It's a fasting situation. I mean, I really, I feel good for Fedotov, obviously, because it's his dream to play in the NHL. And that was kind of taken away from him uh, with everything that happened, right? Yeah. Like people forget that before he got detained and was forced to serve, you know, in the obligatory military service uh, by his, you know, Russian government there, like he signed a two year or he signed a, uh, a one year deal with the Flyers on May 7th, 2022, right? So yeah. his intention was always to come over. And then obviously things happen where, um, you know, he kind of gets captured by Russian authorities in, in July of 2022. And then um, from there, I mean, there's really nothing he can do, right? He's forced to serve at a military base near the Arctic Circle um, <laughs> in God knows where. <laughs> I, mean, I can relate. Eight hours at four drum. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I mean, he's essentially taken away from the game of hockey for a year. Um, and then from that point, um, what happens in a, a critical aspect of, I guess, the Flyers being able to bring Fedotov over is the double IHF, um, the NHL and the KHL um, kind of had a dispute over his contract rights. So the contract he signed with the Flyers in May 2022 um, was told and then still recognized as a valid contract for this season. Um, so basically that is what leaves the door open for him to join the Flyers this year, that the fact that that 22 um, or May uh, 2022 one-year contract that he signed got told over to this season. Um, and then there was a rumor as well that Basically, there's a clause in his Siska Moscow contract uh, that, that after one year of, of playing with, with Siska that he could opt out of the second year of the contract and come to the NHL. I mean, there's no confirmation if that's the case, but nonetheless, it, it's just really good that they could finally get him over here because personally, I didn't think that it was ever going to happen. I, I kind of thought he was KHL bound for probably the rest of his career and, and just maybe forced to kind of stay there due to, to everything that occurred. Um I was surprised they threw him in in the Islanders game uh, just because as a goalie, he didn't even have a full practice yet. So to break in full equipment that he's never used before, I mean, that could be a tough one just to feel out like where pucks are going, where your rebounds are going. But I was really impressed just with how poised, how calm he looked in the net. One thing I really that I was uh, surprised, not surprised by, but as a big guy, I mean, who knows where the puck is going to go. Uh, kind of bouncing off your body, coming in from all different areas, especially when you haven't broken your equipment in yet. So, or equipment in yet, so just the rebound control that he had uh, in that game was really, really good to to kind of start off his NHL career. So I'm interested to see what he could be. Like, there's no telling uh, what he's going to end up being at the NHL level, but I think a goaltending situation with him in the mix versus not, um, it's it bodes well for the Flyers, right? Because you lose Carter Hart. Um, you're kind of in a situation where you're not sure where things are going with the goalie situation. This does add some stability there and it, it gives the opportunity for Urson um, to get some rest here, right? Which is really important. Um, I have a stat here from Alex Appleyard on Twitter, so shout out to him. But the stat essentially is with Urson playing uh, up to under 60 hours of rest this season, he's a 5-9-1 and one record with an 883 save percentage with 60 plus hours of rest between starts he's a 16 6 and 6 uh, record so when you know he has an adequate rest time and he's not playing 25 games in 30 nights and things like that Urson's actually looked good but you know the more they've relied on him as a rookie it's been tough so I think at least you have a concrete option with Fedotov that can maybe uh, help you get some more wins or points whereas Sandstrom I don't think the Flyers were as confident in uh, what do you think, Yuri, just about Fedotov? Yeah, no, I, I, I'll i point back to what Steve said with Fedotov's experience as well. I mean, he's coming in, you know, we bring up this age all the time. He's coming in as a 27-year-old. That is really a developed goaltender. Now he didn't play in the NHL, but if you, he was going through the NHL system, that's like kind of the point where you're like, okay, it's shit or get off the pot time, right? That's kind of where Sandstrom is today. Um and Fedotov is coming in with all of this very valuable experience. Again, he lost a year not playing and then had to kind of work his way back. And even Breer referenced that in his press conference. Um, and that's why he had a better second half of the year than the first half. But, like, we're getting a guy who is seasoned um, beyond our starter, right? Because our yeah. our current starter with Arison is younger, never really played – you know, that much, that many game sevens the or most games he's even played this season is right. Career, uh, so, 
No, yeah, no, exactly. And uh, I just think it's going to be extremely valuable. I would not be surprised if after his performance um, against the Islanders that Tortorella feels a lot more confident in throwing him in and that we're going to see maybe even a 50-50 split here uh, for the last six games of the season and that they might go with Fedotov because I saw nothing in that performance Outside the the one goal he gave up, I mean, I, I don't really. It's not his fault, and it's a pure deflection of a man in front of the net. There's not much he can do about that outside of hitting the guy in the head or whatever to get him out of the way. Um, I just I was really impressed with how he how he looked. I've been really impressed at at times with the rookie Arison, and I think you know this definitely helps. And it almost you wish that he showed up earlier. Um, I, it probably wasn't possible, but you wish that he showed up earlier. You know, before we had to overplay Sandstrom and overplay Peterson, guys who really are not going to steal games for you at the NHL level, um, where it looks like Fedotov might have the ability to do that. So I just feel a lot better with the two goalies yeah. there. Um, well, I'm, he's played huge games, right, Yuri? It, it, yeah. And it, and not only that, his massive size, again, it's not the end-all, be-all, because you can be a big goalie and still get lit up, but there's not a lot of room to shoot at. You know, that's the yeah. one thing you kind of notice. I mean, you look at him in comparison to everybody else on the ice. He's massive. Covers the, yeah, he covers the net even. He literally is taller than the crossbar when he's in the butterfly position on his yeah. knees. That's how, how big the guy well, is. Um, yeah. But I think, uh, I think one thing that's going to at least help him out for the end of this season, and next season will be a different story because teams will have a book on him, a scouting report, but not really many teams have any scouting reports or are really aware of kind of his style, his technique. They didn't even think he would be in the NHL. Well, that's what anyway. I mean, right? So, I mean, to end the season, that'll be a benefit because no one's going to really have the book on how to beat him um, or like a valid scouting report on him, I would imagine. But going to next season, I mean, they will. But I mean, I just think for Fedotov, he's played in huge games, like lost obviously in the Beijing Olympics 2022 you know silver medalist pretty much was the reason Russia got there with a the solid performance when you're on that stage I think games like this don't necessarily impact you all that much or get you nervous which is a good thing right during yeah. the stretch run and so. the Flyers all of a sudden have some Russian hockey players part of this organization they have Gurianov they have Kolosov here and we're going to talk about Kolosov later in the episode they have Fedotov they have Zamula and then you know the mad Russian as uh Torts likes to say uh Mitchkov will be over soon and I, I would like to see that a little bit so a Russian player doesn't come here and is isolated and Fedotov seems to know English already which I thought was really interesting where you know he's not I don't think he's like 100% proficient at it, but he didn't come over here like most Russian players and need a translator. Like he was able to do the press conference on his own. So I think all of that definitely helps. And then, you know, to to that point, Vasily, while nobody has the book on him, he also has not played on NHL ice. He has no yeah. scouting report on any of the teams that he's playing. It's like he's kind of walking in with no advantage as well. So I do wonder what an off season in Philly, getting adjusted here, learning the actual team, you know, I'm I'm interested to see can he push Harrison? Can he will he be the starter next year? We we don't really know. Um, I don't want to jump ahead of that and I don't want to take away from what Harrison has done, but um I was just really impressed in the short small sample size we saw. Like the poise to me really matters. And that's something I always thought hurt um Felix Sandstrom is not just his poise, but his positioning in net. He has athleticism, but he never can really cut down the angles as well as like somebody like Urson. Um, and see through screens as well and and clamp down on rebounds. And we saw that with Fedotov early. Um, yeah, and screens also, aren't a problem when you're six seven. So. That's also exactly <laughs> like it's a little harder to get in front of him. Um, so I don't know. I'm really interested. All right. Any other comments on Fedotov? Otherwise, we're going to get right into player profiles and we'll dig into um, Steve's um, knowledge. No, nothing else uh, on Fedotov? No, but it's it's going to be interesting to see, at least for me, how many games he gets out of the, the remaining, um, you know, little bit that the Flyers have left. If yeah. they kind of lean on him heavier than an Urson with the work that Urson's had. Yeah, uh, t totally. Uh, okay, let's get into it. So this will be move on into the drafted players. So we're going to review... Um, not every single player that was drafted by the Flyers, but I kind of went through and picked out all the relevant ones. Um, and we'll just talk about them individually. But Steve, obviously, we'll let, let you lead the conversation with each one of those. Um, and, uh, you know, the first and foremost, and I always, you know, I either like to start with him or finish with him. And in this case, we're in the meat and potatoes of the episode. So let's start with him. Matt Vay Mitchkov. Uh, 
could I I could not be more excited about a prospect. I don't think I've ever been this excited about a Flyers prospect. It sucks that we have to wait. We don't know exactly when he's coming, but you know, at least we have like a uh the the worst case scenario is in in two more seasons after this one. Best case scenario, maybe Briere does his magic. Um he's been very successful at working out deals so far. Um I would imagine the Flyers are trying to bring him in earlier. Um, whether that is feasible or not, I don't know. Um, they're not going to do anything illegal or unethical or anything like that. But if a business deal can be agreed upon um, and there's money going towards you know, his KHL squad or whatever, I'm sure that they're looking into that. And we'll probably continue to look into it until the day he shows up. Um, having said that, the team is not 100% ready to add a level of that talent to be a significant piece of... Um, that will get us from being, you know, kind of like a middle of the road team to being, you know, a true Stanley Cup contender. They're probably still at least another year from h- hitting that status. Um, but Matt Faye Mitchkov had an exceptional year. Steve, we've talked about him already. Uh, I don't know if everybody listening has listened to those episodes, but give us a breakdown on Mitchkov and then we can speculate a little bit um, beyond that. Well, uh, the last time I was on, uh, we were around the, at the midseason point, but yeah. that our midseason is more like the, the stretch run in the KHL. So he was playing for Sochi. Uh, the team was horrifically bad uh, in his draft year of 22-23. This year, they were a lot more competitive, and he had a lot to do with that. So he, once again, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't say once again, but like with, with Sochi, two seasons ago, he had – Almost about a point of game average, but this year he basically had the full season. So remember we talked about how he started out with Ska, the stupid coach uh, Rotenberg or whatever his name is. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, you know messing around with him in the lineup, uh, scratching him in the early going, and so uh, uh, the, he eventually was loaned back to Sochi, and it was almost like you know kid in a candy store again because he was playing. He averaged about you know, 17 to 18 minutes a game. He was puck dominant. He didn't play center. I know people wanted to see, oh, maybe he should play center. He was a pure wing again. That's just, that's his natural position. But he was, he was dynamic. I know that uh, uh, I like the fact that Flyers fans are now, he, there's like a little subculture, like a, like a, a subset of, uh, the, of the fan base that they are obsessed with this guy yeah. and they track his every move. So, uh, although I did watch a lot of the KHL this year because of uh, Salayev and Artamanov, uh, that I like I don't need to see Mitchkov anymore. I, I, I've, seen, I've watched that kid so much for like four years that he has not changed. He is a game breaker. He's he's the best game breaker outside of the NHL, and there's there's no way you can marginalize what he's accomplished. Whether it's a point a game, point seven five points a game, he's he's as good as he is passing the puck as he is shooting it. I know that we like to call him a sniper. That's where we think of him first as a goal scorer. But he is an outstanding playmaker, a puck distributor. Um, so uh, the season ended. Okay, Sochi stunk again. They didn't make the playoffs, but they definitely improved from last year. And so now he's basically in a hold pattern. Uh, and I'm going to assume that he's just he's a workout freak. So I'm going to assume that he's just going to spend the entire offseason working uh, on his game and any things that uh, the staff might say he has to improve. I remember he still belongs to Ska. So I'd like to think that, and think about Ska is they, they just lost in round two of the playoffs. They are, they are Putin's team. They are supposed to go to the final uh, every year, uh, the Gagarin cup, whatever it is. And they are not going this year. They got eliminated. They, they had issues scoring, they, they actually had a tough time in round one against Torpedo. And so this coach, uh, Rotenberg, uh, he like has no choice. He probably has to make sure that Mitch Kov not only plays for Scott full time, but has him on the top line. And that, that might cause some problems because there's some veteran guys. They were like 40,000 years old and they've been there forever. But you know what? It's a results-based industry. And so uh, I do think, though, that they, they have this tournament in Russia, given they're not allowed to play anywhere else. So they have this tournament called the Black Sea Cup. And I'm pretty sure it's in like May, May time frame. So I think that we haven't seen Mitch Cole play since I think it was like mid to late February, maybe early March. 
but he's going to be playing more than likely in that for either Russia's U25 team or a U20 team. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, as far as him coming early, I know his teammate, his line mate, it's most uh, with uh, with Sochi, who's Nadinov, was a second round pick of uh, Minnesota in 2020. He's a very good player. Uh, he actually played with Mitch Kov in the Scott system even before they played in the KHL. But uh, and he had a good year in the KHL last year. But the stupid coach again screwed around with him. And so he went to Sochi and, and they actually worked out a deal. Minnesota worked out a deal where they bought out his, his KHL contract. Uh, and he's in the NHL right now, uh, who's Nadinov is. So uh, like you no. said, you know, maybe they could do the same. But, uh, you know, Ska is like the freaking, you know, the Lakers or the Yankees or, you know, freaking you know, Alabama football. KHL. Exactly. So I I don't think they're gonna want they're gonna want to give Mitch Kov at least another full season, uh, you know, under their banner, uh, to see what he could do. I mean, we know what he could do. Uh, I I just I I don't like that coach. I don't like him. He's a uh, I think he's the son of like a freaking oil tycoon. Yeah. Uh, he just looks like a he looks. I don't like the way he looks like in terms of like his expressions. He <laughs> the way he treated Mitch Kov and I, yeah, I'm I don't know the guy, so he could be a really nice guy. Maybe we have the same interests, but if he's going to you know, hurt my, my friend Mitch Kov there, I'm not going to like him. So <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. But that's really the, the only storyline for the offseason is going to be, you know, his training, playing in the Black Sea Cup, and then waiting for uh, him becoming a, a Scott full-timer. Yeah, and I, I first of all, I did not know that story about what was the Minnesota prospect's name? Um, Murad Husnadinov. Yeah. yeah, I did not know that. So, He's I playing mean, for the Wild right now, I believe. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. I was not aware of that story. So, and that's kind of what I've told people. I don't, ex I don't expect Mitchkov to come here next year. But on that last year, that contract, I think they're they'll have to pay a lot of money yeah. for that last year. I mean, you're gonna have to overpay to get him out of that contract. But if you're gonna lose him anyway, um, and you have a an opportunity to get a substantial amount of money, you you might take that offer. Right, because it pays for all the salaries of your players, pretty much, and the Flyers will pay for it. Um, let me ask you this, Steve, because this is something we've heard a lot of, and we might have talked about this already. But there's a lot of people kind of downplaying his historic season from a uh, statistical standpoint. The fact that he's outpaced every dominant Russian yeah. that has come downplaying the, the narrative. Well, the narrative, Steve, is that um, essentially the KHL is no longer like a strong of a league as it oh, once was 20 or 30 years ago. But I, I don't really buy that, obviously. Same, but What's I want to hear... Yeah, I want to yeah. hear Steve's thoughts. I me. mean, I mean, that is some... That is reaching. You know what I mean? Like, I've been covering the draft long enough to know that we get excited when a dude in the KHL plays like six minutes in a game. And if he gets a secondary assist on an empty netter, it's like, have a parade. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't know where that came from. I mean... I'm, I'm going to assume there are people out there that don't like Mitchkov, uh, but no, you, you do not. A stat is a stat. You could have the debate and say which era was more difficult, who had it rougher, Ovechkin in, in 03, 04 because of the, the, uh, the lack of scoring and it was more competitive. Okay, so I'm not going to deny that the, the quality of competition in the KHL is not does not measure up to the NHL. Okay. However, the, the, the European leagues have been, are being flooded with North American types. Okay. They're, they're, it's, it's just, it just, it's just the way it is. I don't know why. I don't know why players from North America are now voluntarily going to Russia. It's obviously money has something to do with it, but I, I don't think that cage shell is that much of a step below the AHL. Uh, and like, what if he was doing it in in the SHL, where or the J twenty? I mean, look at the OHL. The OHL is a joke now in terms it's of what it used to close be. Close to those other leagues that you just mentioned. Like the, o I love the OHL, but it is not nearly as physical as it used to be. It no. used to be a mean, angry league where you would have five Brennan Othmans or Jacob Julians, you know, on every team where you they would have skill and size. It's just, speaking of Pronger and Chris Gratton, I mean, think about those teams back in the day. So I, I don't buy it. I, it. It sounds like someone's trying to, or wh wh wherever the, the narrative is coming from, is just not 
I guess, happy that Mitch Kov isn't playing for his team. Yeah, no, that, I think my- I think there's a big hint of that. And I like you look at how strong of a season Connor Bedard is having as a rookie. And again, I don't want to say that Mitch Kov is Bedard, but I really don't see a big difference in the skill set, like in the level of talent. And, you know, I heard how much Fantilli's talked up and how much Carlson's talked up, and they've had pretty good rookie seasons. I don't expect rookies to come in and light the world on fire unless they're on Bedard's, like, level, or at the very least, like, Nathan McKinnon level, right? And he hit a 60-point rookie season, which is very good, right? But the generational typically is an 80-point range. I kind of noticed that. The guys who come in and hit 80 points, point point of game seasons, those are the guys who are on track for generational, at least in this era. And I don't really see a big difference between Mitch Cobb and Bedard, like just visually looking at him. Uh, we'll um, have to wait and see. Right. We'll have to wait and see, right? And because I'm not going to go out and say that, you know, I know I, I, before I said, I've always been careful with my words and said the potential to be an Alexander Ovechkin, right? The potential right. to be an Akita Kucherov. 100%. Like, why would you, it's why would you dismiss that? You know what I mean? It's That's what the draft is all about. It's about gambling. Uh, you know, basically banking on someone, it's like a lottery ch- uh, card or, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's a plain blackjack. Like you, you're gambling that this kid is going to become the next Lindros for the Flyers or the, you know, the next, you know, uh, LeBron James or like whatever. And I'm not saying he is, but the point is that Mitchkov has done nothing wrong yeah. at all. Since I first started watching him four or five seasons ago, he's done nothing wrong. Like, think about the, the criticism that he's faced that, oh, he's a tough teammate and he's selfish and, oh, he's not good on defense. And now, now we're going to move the goalposts even yeah. further and, and yeah. say that the cage shell isn't uh, th- that high quality of a league. You know, so although all, all we have left now is coming to North America and delivering on what a lot of us have been saying. Uh, I, I think it's really unfair uh, to marginalize that kind of talent. And, and we see it. Like, it's not 1979 where we have eight millimeter film reels. Like, we, we could go on social media and see every freaking goal this kid has scored. We could watch every game he's played. And we know what we see. Like, he's a special talent uh, on a Bedard level before the draft. And, you know, obviously Bedard has an advantage over him right now because he's in the NHL and proving himself. But why should we? Why should we doubt Mitchkov? Uh, Mitchkov's ability to do the same. Well, yeah. I'm not. Well, I think Steve, he's done nothing at this point to make us really doubt him based on his play and the what opposite. he's done at the KHL level, right? Like you look at his season um, that he had this this year, and essentially he's almost a point a game, and for his age, that's something that is rarely ever seen, right? Yeah, like like 200 shots. Yeah, which like, is insane. And like. 45 games. <laughs> yeah, he's he, I mean the production is crazy, right? Like 41 points in 47 games. Just to put it in context, it's the most points in a season from a draft plus one player in the KHL ever. Um so like these are <laughs> That's what are, I yeah. Yeah, there's stats you're looking at and I I understand like the skepticism because he hasn't yet done it, but it you know, it's a wait and see situation, but everything he's done so far, it it doesn't point to the fact that he's not going to be able to come to the NHL and, and be an impact player. Like who knows what will happen down the line. But I, I just think to look at those stats and try to, you know, make up certain reasons that, Oh, the KHL is not the same league it used to be. So it doesn't matter if he's a point a game at this age. I think it's just almost excuses in a sense. Um, but I'm really interested to see, you know, what Mitchkov can do once he gets over. I think, like you said, Steve, he's definitely going to probably stay um, in Russia for one more season in the KHL um, playing, you know, for Ska. It'll be interesting. Um, the relationship with him and Rottenberg, obviously they had a rocky relationship to start this season. They'll have to mend the fences or, or mend that somehow to see, uh, you know, where it goes. And at least for Mitchkov to, you know, have success with the team next season. Um, but I just think from what I've seen from him and the skill and the talent level, how could you look at that and say, well, yeah, there's no way that can translate. It's just, I mean, it's preposterous I, to me. It, might, it has to be personal because like, that's what we do as, as uh, evaluators and fans. Like, like when you're a fan of a team and the top prospect is down at AAA 
and he's, you know, 14 and two, you're not going to be like, oh, well, the competition's not good down there. Like, you know, you're going to be excited yeah. and yeah. you're going to wait for him to come. And now we could have that discussion and compare the KHL numbers when he gets here. And if there's a struggle or a slumping, uh, a slump uh, where he, he's not a point of game and then there's pressure and OK, that that's totally fair. But it just sounds like like I don't think anybody's been saying that he's going to show up and be the greatest player in history. We're just saying that look at what he has done. There's yeah. no reason why we should not be excited. And that goes for the entire NHL. Yeah, okay. As a fan of a team who will play will play him in the division, maybe I'll change my tune eventually. But like this is something that oh. I, I've always used the Forsberg example and the buildup. It was the Lindros was the same way. It was a buildup. It was anticipation, but it was excitement, and you followed their every move. And th there's really no reason why we should uh, steer off course and focus on, on uh, the quality of a, of a of a league compared well, to, let's say, 30 years ago. It's it's funny how nobody does that. And, and Cutter Gauthier is obviously having a great season uh, in the NCAA. He's also on a stacked team. Stacked, right? and, beyond stacked. And, and, and nobody goes, oh, well, he's on a stacked team. That's why He's not even he's, the best player on his team. That that's kind of what I'm saying is like no one is making those adjustments for if anything, I heard the opposite with Cutter Gauthier. All of a sudden Cutter Gauthier is uh gonna be a top five goal scorer in the NHL. And you know, I, I didn't even see that from him when I saw I, I saw a highly skilled player who has potentially be a 40 goal scorer, but there was almost like this, oh well, he's gonna be better. It, it's almost like the narrative kind of changes depending on what the story media context is. And I'm just like so not interested in that. All I yeah. see from Mitchkov, and I could def definitely be wrong. I see a player who is capable to be that Kucherov level, that Panarin guy, the guy who's at the top of the league every single year in points. That's well, what I see. I could be wrong, but that's all I see. I, I again, I even the short amount of time I've seen him, and what I bring to question, and Basilia, you can hop in, is what happens if Rottenberg again chooses not to play him which i think would be unlikely and also insane um but if they again choose to loan him out um i do wonder what happens if that is the case which would be clearly go back personal. to sochi yeah go, right, back, go, to sochi. Back, go back to sochi or light I mean, it up at that point try to get out of the contract somehow well, i'm sure there's I'm sure uh, there would be like for Mitchkov's side of it, like he would not be happy with that decision. Um, oh. It seems like he really wants to play for Scott at some point, at least for one full season here before yeah. he jumps to the NHL. But just to end it off with the Mitchkov conversation, like I think it's funny to me because historically, I don't think it matters if it's Mitchkov or not. If it's any player in the KHL putting up these types of numbers, you have to expect and you have to kind of give credit in, or credits uh, or credit to the fact that um, anybody putting up those types of numbers could probably come to the NHL and have a large impact, right? Like it, it's just the nature of it. Um, you don't go back and look at like prior players who did it and say, "Oh, look at you know how Malkin or Kucherov scored at the KHL level whenever they were in the league." Nobody talked about how uh -huh. the league was at a worse competition level in the AHL. It's just, it, it has to do, at least for me, it's the, the Russian factor, the whole Russian narrative. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a bias, it seems, unfortunately, but it's just where we're at. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, 100% agree. I, I just can't wait to see him. I'm, I'm almost hoping yeah. Rottenberg ruins the relationship with him. Uh, so he <laughs> wants to leave earlier, but I do wish him the best in his development. I mean, it would probably... I don't think there should be a huge rush to bring any young player into the NHL, um, even though I do think he could play already in the NHL and be probably in the Flyers' top six day one. Um, I, actually, I don't even doubt he would be a top-line player on this team today just with his skill set. Um, but it's only well, a good thing. He's going to come in seasoned. I mean, that, listen, uh, Fedorov, Bure, McGillney, again, I'm dating myself, but like you know, when the, when the Iron Curtain fell... Uh, we just knew these guys based on what they did at the Olympics or the World Junior Tournament. There's no way that you can say that a cage shell development is detrimental. Panarin, uh, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Kuznetsov, Tarasenko, if it's two years, if it's three, in some cases, five, six, this is a real league with real pressure, with a real tra the, the travel is ridiculous in Russia. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a very big country. So th there are so many factors that benefit Mitchkov 
right now by staying in the KHL and not being here. He, he, he And the other thing is, too, Sochi is a beautiful city. It's like a beach community. <laughs> so, like, and, you know, it's not that, you know, St. Petersburg is also a beautiful city, but it's way north. It's colder. So he wins either way. He plays for his boyhood, uh, you know, the team of his dreams, or he's on the beach scoring 25 goals in 40 games or whatever it is. Let me ask one more thing about Mitch Cobb. This just came to me. You know, we talk about the ice difference for a goaltender, and I look at Mitch Cobb's game, and look, he's not considered a burner, um, though I kind of suspect that he is much faster than people think yeah. he is. He could accelerate. It's... Yeah. He could accelerate. I, I would assume that his game actually would translate better to the NHL with a smaller ring size, his ability to work in, in tight, his stick handling, his shot. Um, the I pivoting wouldn't be with the skating. Right. I, insane, I would imagine so. he could exceed – uh, what that he's is. doing on a smaller on a smaller rink than a larger rink. What do you think about that, Steve? I mean, if we only knew what 31 other scouting departments and play development staffs think when they watch him play, you know, if we only knew. Yeah, you could not like Russians. You could, you know, he's, he's your enemy now because he wasn't drafted by your team. But I just have it. I have a very hard time believing that there isn't a single GM, development staff, scouting director, you know, marketing department that wouldn't love to have this kid on their team to be a part of their organization because the, the opportunities are endless. All right. I know there'll be a language barrier and, you know, he's probably working on that already, but I, I don't see there being, uh, to your point, uh, you know, I, I saw him play on, on, a, on a North American sheet and it just his style. It's not a, a, a North South, you know, basically uh, manipulating time and space like he creates time and space on his own he's low maintenance he doesn't need people to get you know, create space for him or like a a big body to take tackle two guys or along the boards and he no he'll, he'll do it if it's if the opportunity presents itself but this is a young man that is very capable of dominating in any level in terms of creating time and space for himself and the most important thing, which is getting clean looks at the net and scoring goals. I mean, who, who's better outside the NHL right now scoring goals than Matt V. Mitchkov? I, I mean, it's it's actually a debate. We could have that kind of debate that that Mitchkov is one of the top players outside the NHL at scoring goals. Well, and the score. Say he is if, you the ask, top if you ask the scouting rankings, it'd be Cutter Gautier, but um, we know how valid those are. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, let's move past Mitch Cobb, even though I could talk about him all day and let's get into the other players within the flyer system. So another guy that I thought this would be kind of topical to bring him up now, um, cause people really have not seen him at all. Uh, Hunter McDonald coming over from the NCAA. He signed a oddly a, uh, a tryout contract with the flyers, even though, um, I do suspect he will get a regular ELC at some point. Flyers were very high on him. Uh, Fletcher brought him up before uh, he left and after uh, Keith Jones brought him up recently. And, you know, this guy's got really good size. Um, I did notice he's, he's playing for the Phantoms right now. He had a plus four game the other night. Uh, seems to be playing a somewhat of a big role for the Phantoms already. Had kind of injuries, missed some time, uh, but seems to be maybe a diamond in the rough here. Not a guy that I would expect to be, you know, maybe even a top four defenseman at the NHL level as far as offensive production, his ability to maybe move the puck up the ice, you know, might not be that high. I don't know exactly. I haven't really seen him play too much outside of camp. Um, but defensively could be that future, you know, let's let's just say Nick Sealer because he's the best defensive defenseman for the team right now. Um, but that shut down pure defensive defenseman guy um, who's physical and can, help your penalty kill, help your, your defensive zone time. Um, Steve, can you tell us why the Flyers are so high on him, um, even with the small sample size and the success he's had for the Phantoms, but why are the Flyers so high on Hunter McDonald? That, it's actually a pretty good question, considering all the prospects they have and how patient they've been with their defensemen. Uh, maybe, you know, in the past, they were patient with the likes of like, you know, like a Wyatt Wiley or a, you know, who's the other guy? Uh, um, uh, the big kid, the big guy was a high pick uh, that had an injury issue. San, was it um, Mor oh my God. Moran? San, Moran. Sam Moran. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah like, uh, you know, so, you, you know, you, you wait and you wait and you wait. And maybe they're like, you know what? 
Uh, you know, this kid McDonald is interesting. So I'm a Northeastern guy. I went to Northeastern. I worked for the, the sports information department there. So I know the ins and outs of Matthews Arena, the program, everything. And so they like this kid a lot. Uh, he's very mature. Uh, he was drafted as a double overager. So he's, I think, already like, he's like 20 years old. Yep. Uh, 21. I think, yeah, so he's, he's a... He's also um, from New York, which I didn't know. Yeah, I think he's from like the Buffalo area, I, I Fair, believe. Fair point, New York is what it's looking Yeah, uh, but the thing about this kid is that Northeastern did not have a good year this year, uh, but he was definitely on their top pairing, and he was the safety net for the guy, uh, Borgesy, uh, the, the, he's like a playmaker. And I think he's actually, he's, he's a, he's a Philly area kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, but, but McDonald was the, was the safety net, the, the defensive defenseman to their offensive defenseman. And he played that role great. And he's a, an outstanding shot blocker. He's got size, but he could skate. Now what he does with his wheels, that, that remains to be seen. That's like what I said, play development. It's what their job is to tap into his strengths and, and, and uh, maybe perfect them uh, for lack of a better term. But Northeastern really like if they, I, I think I don't know what the rules are, but if he signed an ATO, he's done with college. He's not yeah, going back. I would imagine. Yeah. So, so Northeastern lost their best defensive defenseman. And, you know, listen, if, if, if you like cle uh, crease clearing and shot blocking and, uh, you know, sticking up for teammates and mixing it up after the whistle and delivering a big hit every now and again, then he's your guy. Uh, but th there's definitely some work to be done in terms of like, uh, you know, puck management and uh, like, you know, you know, how does he handle a four check? If he's got the wheels, which he does have, you want to see maybe be a, a little bit more patient and not rush into things. Sometimes uh, you see these defensive defensemen when they play with, um, offensive types, you just got to give them the puck and then you go and you position yourself to protect them if in case they mess up. So uh, he's not a, let's say, uh, puck dominant kind of a guy. But, you know, may maybe listen, the, the Flies, if you look at their depth chart on defense, you got a lot of big guys who aren't very physical. You got a lot of smaller guys who are physical, but, you know, they're not very big and you have to wonder if they're going to translate to the NHL. So maybe they're like, you know what, every team has a guy like this. They have a guy who's six, five, you know, like uh, he, he clears the crease. He's late and close. He, he'll, the big thing with him though, is blocking shots. The guy blocks like a zillion shots. So, you know, Tortorella, <laughs> Tortorella probably had to say in, uh, in uh, what, what uh, his path was after college. So I, I'll call him still a project. I'm not gonna get too excited about it, but I haven't seen him play in Lehigh Valley yet. So uh, I don't know how well the, the transition uh, how the transition has been from NCAA to uh, the AHL. But yeah, I mean, he's definitely a guy that we have to uh, clearly that, like you said, the flyers are high on him. If they take a, a double overage from what is it? Was it like the, the sixth round? The, the yeah, fifth he's, round? A, he's a sixth round pick um, in that 2022 draft, 165th overall. Yeah, I think that's the goal for the flyers, right? Uh, sixth round pick. Typically, the chances of making the NHL are slim. Yeah. Um, so I think the progression he's shown so far um, with two two seasons at Northeastern and then signing the ATO with the Phantoms, um, I think he's coming along nicely, um, obviously, the way that they would have hoped. Really high on him. I mean, like Yuri said, Chuck Fletcher mentioned him in multiple interviews. Uh, he is a Chuck Fletcher um, pick. Um and then also was mentioned by Keith Jones and Daniel Briere. So the Flyers like his game. I think their probably hope for him is okay, shut down, third pairing type, you know, yeah. defensive defenseman who's going to clear the crease, block a ton of shots, almost like a replacement for a Nick Sealer down the line, Rasmus Bristolin and type, where maybe those types of guys aren't here, um, you know, for the next really competitive um, Flyers team. Maybe that's a role they're hoping that he can fill. But I agree, Steve, just with that, you know, the Flyers defense, at least in terms of the prospects, they do have a lot of smaller defensemen. Um, so adding him, I mean, having him come into the fold, giving him kind of a, an ELC with the Phantoms would be, a, would be a good thing just to try to get him some more experience, see how he handles that, see if there's an NHL future eventually. Yeah, I, I, he seems like a moldable type of player, right? If he's progressed this Coachable. much, and he, yeah, and he has all those intangibles that 
you know, a lot of NHL coaches would look for, especially John Tortorella. It looks like they're kind of like, oh, if we can push this guy in the right direction. And I love that you brought up Sam Morin. It's like maybe he can fill that void that we hoped that Sam Morin was going to give us. But, you know, obviously he was cut short by injury. Um, he's a little bit smaller than Sam, but again, 6'4 is great size for a defensive defenseman. So um, I'm just excited to see how he turns out. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a long look at training camp next year, just off of the sheer fact that he does things that Tortorella likes. Like he's probably not going to be NHL ready, but hope they'll probably get a, a long look just because of his style of the game. Um, I'm excited to see how it grows. Okay, let's get into the next guy, and this is one that everybody is following, um, a guy who has exceeded at least everybody on the Internet's expectations. I don't think he exceeded your expectations, Steve. Um, a guy that Vasily and I are very high on. I don't know if I want to label him a Braden Point guy. That's a very high praise. But if he even sniffs that territory, if he's 70% of Braden Point, this is a humongous home run for the Flyers. Denver Barkey, who just finished his 100-plus point season, um, also playing on a very good team, but clearly a huge reason why they're a very good team. And a guy with all of the attitude that the Flyers covet um, and all the uh, aggressiveness and the tenacity of somebody even like Travis Konechny, who is obviously beloved here in Philadelphia. Um, what can you tell us about Barkey's season? And, uh, you know, how do you kind of see his like NHL future at this point? Well, I mean, he was the first round pick for me. I had him ranked right. ahead of Easton Cowan. So I, I wasn't necessarily that shocked when Cowan went in the first round because it seemed like a Maple Leafs kind of thing to do. And, and Cowan really did have a, a really good draft season for London as a top line guy for a, a prominent program. Um, but the Barky to me was always like, oh, I like this kid better. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just, I kind of gravitated towards his style. He's, 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 uh, abrasive. He's energetic. Uh, he's quick, but I, I, I think when we, and I, I don't want to repeat myself, uh, because I know I've spoken about him in the past. I, I think I might've even spoken about him before he was drafted by the flyers. I said like, Hey, he's a guy to keep an eye on. Um, and it's just one of those luck of the draw things, you know, broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, but with Barky, the reason why I was so high on him was because he was a top line wing, multi-situational top line wing in his draft year for a very good program that was destined or uh, competing for not just an OHL title, but for the Memorial Cup. So I'm like, that's a big deal. I mean, these are Canadian kids. The Memorial Cup to Canadian kids is almost like, you know, the NCAA March Madness to for basketball players. It's a huge deal. And so uh, to have that kind of response now, of course, they didn't get there. But I think that's kind of driving what London is doing this year because they are just laying waste to everybody. And that team, you know, Bonk is on the team. So you have, you know, it's easy for the Flyers uh, scouts because you got two of the top players in all of Canadian Major Junior, one being a wing, the other one being a defenseman playing on the same team. So there's plenty of viewings. I haven't watched him all that much this year. I, I mean, I watched uh, the two guys, O'Reilly and Dickinson, but I don't, I don't focus on Barky because I know, what I, I know what I know, and he's really just, he's just always in the mix. He's always involved. And the last thing I'll say about him is that his center was uh, Win Ryan Winter, I think was his center last year. And this guy leaves, winner and leaves, and then they bring in the, the overage kid, J well, he's draft overage kid, Jacob Julian, a big physical center. I think uh, who drafted him? Like Arizona might have drafted him, maybe Winnipeg. Someone drafted Jacob Julian. And if you don't know who Jacob Julian is, Brendan, Brendan Othman, who's a very, very hard hitter, the Ranger prospect, yeah. tried to nail him. <laughs> And and he just bounced off. He went flying. Like and just when I saw Julian do that, I'm like, all right, this kid's pretty good. The Jets know what they're doing. Uh, yeah, he's a Jets draft pick. Uh, yeah. So the, the 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 transition has been seamless. Where you're now playing with instead of like a, a more fast, energetic, uh, 200 foot type in winter, and now barking cow and playing with this guy uh, Julian, who's a, a, who's a physical, and it's it's almost like it's completely been seamless. And so, listen, you know, if if you saw an uptick in ice time, uh, if you had him playing more minutes, Barky, that is, last year, you probably would have seen about an 80, 85-point season. So this is usually what we see with these London Knights on the Dale Hunter. Evangelista is another one uh, where, uh, you know, Nashville second-round pick, where he was 
produced on a line like uh, Denver Barkey, and then the next year, bam, 100 points, and now Evangelis is in the NHL. So uh, it was a great pick for where they got him. Um, I, I would say that we, we there's always this small chance that OHL production is not necessarily a guarantee because it's a more offense-friendly uh, league now. But, I mean, it's like you said, he's going to fit that mold that they want. Uh, aggressive, in-your-face, tenacious, doesn't take shifts off, works hard at the end of every shift, dies for loose pucks to get it out of the zone on the penalty kill. All, all the stuff like that. I mean, the skill was there, but the, the, the you know, the, the extra effort is what's going to really help them make it in the NHL. I yeah, like I've it. seen a few, I've seen a few games from him, Steven. He just seems like a really high energy, tenacious type player. Um, I plan to watch more. I mean, the OHL playoffs and all that is, is starting to begin. So it's going to be interesting to see if they can, uh, you know, make it back to the Memorial Cup, um, London. And I mean, it was a it was a devastating loss for them last season. But yeah. if if you look at it, I mean, just the jump for for Barky's pretty insane, right? He goes from fifty nine points last season, um, in sixty one games to one hundred two points in sixty four games. So it's a huge jump. It's like a you know forty three point jump for him just a year later. So it just shows the skill that he's you know, always kind of had, it's going to be interesting for me just to see what the flyers end up doing with him. Cause he seems like a really smart player on the ice. They kept him around pretty late here. Um, and you know, development camp, um, coming into this season, but he, I mean, he's, is only 154 pounds. At least that's what he's listed on hockey DB. So obviously a guy that'll need to bulk up a little bit, uh, but it's going to be interesting, right? Just because the CHL NHL transfer agreement, obviously um, any players under 20 have to go back to their junior team. So I want, I do wonder like how much is there for a guy, you know, just put up 102 points in that OHL, like, how much is there really left for him to learn um, in the league? So we'll see where he goes, but it, I for sure could see him getting a nine game trial with the flyers um, to start next season and then kind of see where it goes. If they send him back to junior uh, from that point. Yeah, yeah. It goes back to what I said about the flyers lacking, you know, high end skill types, at least right now uh, at the NHL level. So I'm not saying that a guy like Barkey is going to come in 19, 20 years old and set the world on fire. But, you know, you're seeing it with Logan uh, Stankoven in Dallas. There's a guy that, like, you know, he just he just scores everywhere he's been. And he shows up to the NHL and he he earned it. And I think Bark is the kind of guy that's just going to earn. Uh, if he doesn't earn it with his skill, with his scoring, he's going to earn it with his effort and his penalty killing and his speed and his uh, – you just things like that are going to rub off and on the rest of the team. It's infectious and – you know, uh, just again, a, just a great pick, a great freaking that. That's what you do uh, with those kinds of picks. Like you just you go for the the guys that just have the potential to change the momentum of a, of a game, either with their skill or with their effort. And that's what Barkey does as a forward. It's 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 good to see. Yeah, and he, I mean, statistically, it's like it's kind of similar to the flyer they took on Morgan Frost. Like Morgan Frost is a sixty point player. Uh, in the OHL when he was drafted, and then you know he jumped up. To, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was plus 100 points, 110 second, points, 110 points, right? So I look at that, and you know, to where you had him, Steve, as a late first round pick. I mean, that's how he's producing right now, and that is on the track that he's on. He's on the same track yeah. as Ethan Cowan. So it looks like the Flyers really did a great job by grabbing him in the third round, and uh, it's paid off. And I, I am very high on this kid. I, I'm trying to temper my expectations. Like, I don't expect him to be, like, a superstar in the NHL. I mean, if he turns out to be a, a point, great, phenomenal. But I, it's not my expectation of him. But my expectation is maybe that nine-game trial maybe makes the NHL early and slowly builds his career. Having said that, you know, bringing him in as a 20, 20-year-old 20 wouldn't be the worst thing in the world either. Uh, he doesn't even turn 19 till uh, end of April, so... Um, he's still 18, yeah. so has to put some size on for sure. So yeah, sure. time. With yeah, that. he he seems like the type of guy who he's. I've said it over and over again. He looks 14 to me when I look at him. So <laughs> I I think that he would benefit just from extra time, and he probably would be that guy who evolves at a rate you know beyond kind of what is expected of him, just because of the physical immaturity that he has. And I look for that type of stuff in players, and so far so good. So let's get into his teammate. You mentioned him earlier, a former first round pick of the Flyers. Somebody I think the Flyers have a lot of hope in. Um, I think his ceiling is kind of unknown to people. A lot of people kind of 
uh, outside of yourself, you you kind of labeled him in the past here as a potential top pairing. A lot of people try to kind of stifle that and say that he's a top four defender, and that is what he will be. Having said that, he completely completely exceeded his offensive output. Uh, he went from putting up 10 goals to 24 goals this year, um, 43 assists, 67 points in 60 games, plus 28. Uh, obviously had the showing the World Junior Championship. Um Oliver Bonk, uh, don't know still. I still don't know what to make of him uh, exactly, but I do look at these type of guys who are kind of under the radar uh, defensemen who do kind of the defensive game right and then can slowly build an offensive game and become something a lot more than people anticipated. And I see him on track for that right now. So, Steve, what do you what do you have to say about Oliver Bonk and his season? Listen, London is uh, plus. I wrote it down. Plus one twenty five in gold differential. All right, in a juggernaut. <laughs> okay, I mean, th- plus one twenty five. They have, uh, you know, Dickinson is going to be a probably a top ten pick, maybe even top five. The other defenseman, but yeah, like that is it. They are a transition team. Okay, they like to play with pace. They just push the puck with a ton of speed to the neutral zone. So, and it's not like Bonk is one of those defensemen that's getting all his points, and he's. He's improved in every statistical category. But what I'm noticing is that the points he's getting, many of the points he's getting is off of his defensive plays. It's not like he's doing stuff in the, so it's, it'll be something like a battle in the corner in the defensive end and his stick work is, is basically elite. It's, it's, I would say it's NHL caliber right now. The way he uses his stick, one hand on the guy, one hand on the stick, that, that stick is doing all types of damage to the poor puck carrier or the other guy, the opponent fighting for it in the corner or along the boards and little tiny subtle chips off of board battles and it springs the attack. He's gotten a lot of secondary assists that way. On top of that, then you fast forward to the offensive zone. He's, he's like a forward operating off the cycle. He's got a very hard shot. He could run the power play. Um, I haven't watched London enough to determine – who I would classify as their pure number one power play quarterback because they have Dickinson and then they have uh bunk. And I think they're both, I think Dickinson has more points. And usually when I watch it, he's usually on the ice. They don't go f- uh, two and three, two D and f- three forwards. It's usually one and four. I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's, uh, it's one and four. Uh, but even still bunk is, is a power play quarterback. He could be technically called a specialist. But you also have him on the ice, and his partner is usually a, a George. The uh, I think he's an Islander draft pick, Isaiah George, and you know that kid's definitely improved as well. But he, you know, he's still developing, so he's bailing out his partner a lot. He's still doing it, uh, but it's not like London's really been in a position where they they. I mean, they're always winning by a lot, uh, but you know, it, I mean, I'm not going to say that that he is. Uh, just a guy that that's piggybacking on the success of others and London's oh London's good and he's just like he's a uh, he's he's a legit like key cog like he's a guy that I don't think London would be where they are without him uh even in as talented as that blue line is with the NHL draft picks and uh that deadly top line and all the depth support that they get like uh it's almost like he's the head of Ultron you know what I mean he he's He's a he's a very important piece, and on top of that, you have the NHL bloodlines. You have the um, the maturity, the way he processes the game. I just, yeah, I don't, why would we say he's not a top pairing? He doesn't have a top pairing upside. If you're top pairing for the London Knights, you have freaking top pairing upside in the NHL. I mean, that's just how it works. I I don't know. There seems to be kind of. Um... I I don't want to say it's a bias or anything like that, but there's almost a downplay of every Flyers prospect right now. Um, out by, by it, what it, by the oh, by the fan base or by outside? Uh... It, it seems to be mostly our fan base. I'll say that because um, the it varies as far as the media goes. But outside of Cutter Gote, it was downplayed before he was traded, and then upplayed after he was traded. Um, there's people kind of saying, you know, oh, you know, I don't see top pairing from this guy, and my attitude usually is, you know, he's a kid. You're not gonna see it. Um, I mean, to be fair, like the, the Hextall era rebuild didn't well, sound, draft picks didn't hit, yield the, so. the, the results that we thought. And I was on, you know, before I was on with you guys, I was on, uh, you know, some Philly podcasts and I was basically saying like, yeah, get excited, be excited about these guys. They're good. 
They're up and coming, the Wade Allisons and the LaBerges and the Rutsovs. So I get it. I, I get the apprehension. Um, and and listen, I, I'm a guy that definitely gets a little bit too excited about the, the draft prospects he covers because I watch them a lot. And when you see him at this level, I'm not, you're not, you're not dealing with the distractions you get at the NHL, the money, the, the, uh, the, the, the relationship, uh, the, uh, the, the, the infighting, the, the uh, battles with the coaches, all that stuff happens as you get older and you make more money. You think I know everything. I'm not saying that that's going to be the case with bunk. So I get it. Like things happen where these kids don't make it. But in terms of like, same thing with Mitch Kov, like we said, like he's done nothing wrong. So, you know, you draft a guy in the first round, everybody had him in the first round uh, or close to it at least. And now you have, like I said, one of the best defensemen in all of Canadian major junior. Why would we marginalize that? Why would we say yeah. that? No, I don't see it. Unless you just want to be right. If it doesn't happen, I, I can't see, I can't understand why. That's probably, I it. think, I think for Bonk, the encouraging thing is the flyers obviously pinpointed him in the draft initially just due to his defensive skills, defensive prowess. Um, so to see him kind of up things from an offensive standpoint, I think that's probably the, the biggest factor, at least if you're the Flyers management looking at his season this year, right? Like he significantly ups his offensive production from 40 points to 67 points. So that's a really um, big thing for his development. I, I think one thing too, that, people overlook as well is just the fact that, you know, his father Radic also played in the NHL. Um, it's tough sometimes to make the jump to the NHL level. It can be a big adjustment for people. Um, he kind of has firsthand knowledge into that uh, with his father to help him through that. So I think that could be a, a really understated thing for a lot of these prospects, a lot of these kids. But I, I think just looking at Bonk, I mean, Flyers fans should have every reason to be excited. Like you said, Steve, he hasn't done anything wrong. Essentially, he's improved from last season and uh, in his draft plus one year. So I think he definitely has, uh, you know, top pairing type potential. Potential. I don't know, albeit if it's as a number one guy, but I think a number two type, I could definitely see it with yeah. the shutdown ability and some offensive instincts as well. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely. That's not an easy. That, that's not an easy program to play for either. I mean, that that's as close as you'll get to an NHL Dale team. Hunter, the, yeah. the Knights are covered. Dale Hunter is the, the the Hunter brothers. Like that is a like. I mean, it's a it borderline's a little weird how uh, uh, obsessed people are with the London Knights, especially. I think I watched one broadcast and it was like, oh, and here's some London Knights merchandise. And oh, and let's talk about the London. It was like a national broadcast, but everything was about the London Knights and promoting the brand. Uh, it's, it's, it's again, it is like a, a, it's not easy. Like when Dale Hunter chooses you to be his number one or to tackle the toughest assignments, you are doing something right. And he, and he, Dale Hunter has this track record. He just, does, no matter how much we hate him, as, Former fan, as fans of uh, you know the the team he used to of uh, you know the teams he used to hate him and he's teams he would boy he always the dirty player and all the penalty minutes you got to respect the guy for developing NHL players developing junior kids does it preparing them for a life in the NHL and so I think Bonk with his father and Dale Hunter and the program and the success and the uh, it's just everything is going is trending in the right direction yeah now I'm super hyped on him I'm interested to see how he turns out at camp because. I think he's also going to get a long look. I don't think they're going to rush yeah. to get him in the NHL. But um, again, anytime a team is taking a long look at a player, it probably means he's either ahead of schedule or right on schedule. Um, and that's always a great sign. All right, let's get in our next guy. We'll move away from the London Knights. And this is Alex Bump, a player who recently moved over to the NCAA. Uh, by all measures of my understanding, NCAA having 14 goals, 22 assists, 36 points in 38 games, a plus seven, uh, was named, I think, Rookie of the Month at one point, if I remember correctly off the top of my head. Uh, Alex Baum seemed to have had a great season in the NCAA as a 20 or 19 to 20 year old. Um, and, you know, we got to see a little bit of him at camp and he looked really good. Uh, looks to have some scoring upside, has the size to be an NHL player already. Uh, he's listed at 200 pounds at six foot. So he's got some thickness to him kind of like an Owen Tippett type um so I'm I'm really interested to see what this guy is Steve what can you tell us my name's Alex Bump people call <laughs> me Alex Bump <laughs> no, all kidding aside um we talked about him a lot um in previous podcasts because uh I'm a big fan 
of the Minnesota State Tournament. Uh, I have been for a while now. I make it a point to make it mandatory viewing. I don't miss a game. If I do, it's like usually like family related stuff. And so Bump was a kid that if you follow the right people who cover Minnesota hockey, uh, they'll always tell you like, hey, the, the and they, there's always like the Mr. Hockey finalist. So that's the easy way out. But I like to, you know, talk to people and get their opinions on who are the kids that are dominating that aren't just dominating because they're bigger than, you know, the, the typical five foot six freshman defenseman or like, a, you know, the junior defenseman or whatever. And that's the that's the the the, the one of the problems with watching U.S. high school hockey because uh, you, you could see kids. Actually, it's like Gretzky against a bunch of freaking, you know, uh, you know, midget kids, uh, midget level kids where it's like, you know, a, a 25 year old dude against 10 year olds. Um, some, some of these bigger kids, they have that ability and you can't get too excited over that because that's not going to be the case when they get to the USHL and it won't be the case when they get, when they get to college. And that's usually what the path that these typical top Minnesota kids take with bump. I mean, man, what this kid, uh, and he's not that big. He's like, he's, he's bulky, he's thick, but he's like six foot. But what, what I saw when I watched him play for prior Lake was, a, a, a potential I'm not going to say potential because he was the first overall pick but like almost like a Rick Nash the way that he was able to just have people hang on him and it, it and, and nothing stopped him from getting where he wanted to go to from going where he wanted to go, get to uh, delivering the puck where he wanted it to go to shooting the puck where he wanted it to go to like he dominated on a level that I, I didn't see all that often and even at Minnesota high school level so he was originally committed to Vermont. I'm like, guy, that's a huge win for Vermont to get that kind of a prospect. And I think I even ranked him in like in the top 40. Uh, Central Scouting had him in somewhere in the hundreds. But I'm like, no, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, take a gamble and I'm gonna rank him pretty high. So he decommits from Vermont. I mean, he goes to the USHL. You know, he does his thing in USHL. Everything's promising. His draft plus one. Uh, but then he goes to to Western Michigan. And, uh, you know, NCHC is a very physical conference and uh, like right off the bat. And uh, again, I, I'm, I'm a fan of this kid, so I try not to get too caught up with what he does, but nothing has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed with him. Same, same thing with Mitch Kov, same with, the, with some of the other guys we've talked about where he is like dictating terms on when he's on the ice as a freshman. And he's like a 19 year old freshman. He's not like, you know, a 21, 22. Uh, where he was in the USHL for like four or five years. So uh, the ceiling is very high. I mean, and I'm not going to call him just a goal scorer because he's also a playmaker. And we've, I've seen him deliver high-end passes, uh, execute odd man rushes and making the right decisions. And you can't just say, well, Bump is going to shoot the puck because he's got an elite shot. Like you can't play the shot. You have to play the pass. And you also have to play for him switching his angle and cutting inside. Because he's a pretty good skater for his uh, his his body type, so yeah, I'm I'm not gonna like brag about it, but I'm not surprised. I'm not I'm not surprised that he's he's doing you know as a freshman in college for a pretty good program, an NCAA tournament caliber program, that he is one of the best players. And this is a fifth round pick, right? For yep. fifth fourth round pick, fifth round, yeah, yep. fifth yep. round in uh, 2022. But yeah, he. To your point, Steve, I mean, as a freshman, right, like he's having a huge season, 36 points, 38 games. And surprisingly, he's got even more assists than goals, where I think a lot of people thought he was more of a shooter than a playmaker. But like you were saying, um, it seems like the passing prowess is always also there as well. So that's that's an encouraging thing for, you know, a development standpoint to see that come around, too. Uh, but Bump's going to be interesting because I know your review feel the same, but we saw him in development camp. He looked like essentially the best flyer on the ice, um, <laughs> which is not a surprise. He seems like he could be one of those late round steals, and I would not be surprised if the Flyers try to bring him over to the AHL next year. Um, I don't think he has an ELC, um, but he can't be no, too, not yet, not yet. But he can't be too far away from it. Maybe they'll give him another year in the NCAA. Um, but he seems like the type of guy that could develop slowly and be, I don't know, a third line scorer in the NHL. Um, maybe even more, you know, it's kind of up to him, not up to me, but, um, he seems to have a lot of value at the NHL level, at least for, uh, definitely for a fifth round pick and the flyers. And I know you say this, Steve, for sure at the fifth round level, the flyers have been a 
extremely successful of late. I believe Noah Cates was fifth round or fourth round, but in that that kind Noah of Noah Cates, Lynn Blom, um, yep. they, they've been kind of hitting a lot of home runs there of guys who the very least have NHL potential third line player, which is you know if you get anything out of fifth round pick, it's fantastic. Uh, let alone a guy who's almost a point per game player uh, in the NCAA level. I think it's pretty pretty damn good. Um, all right, let's move on from bump and let's go to another NCAA player uh, in his second year in the NCAA player who at one point, you know, was kind of fell out of favor with the fan base because nobody really knows much about him. But Owen McLaughlin, um, he also had a very What's good Flyers fans hating their own prospects. Well, we, like, if it's not in front of your face, people kind of just give up on guys um, if they don't make the NHL early, like the way we talk about pretty much anyone like if they don't but think about where he was turned on tk he's... we turned on lawton <laughs> we turn we turn on everybody who doesn't produce immediately and it isn't yeah, but on these the are late round picks like you're supposed to be excited like it's yeah. just like well, i'm not saying you have to be a freaking optimist all the time oh they're all going to be stars but it's out of sight out of mind well 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 i'll talk about mclaughlin but it's like it's like if the kids aren't doing well if they're not doing well then fine but when they're doing well i'll be like nah, that's not enough but he's a well, seventh nobody... round pick. Like, what are you expecting from him, right? Like, as long as is as a seventh round pick, if you just make it even to the AHL or even like as a fourth liner, that's a, really a success, I would say, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So McCl- again, I think it's one of those things where we talk about the top guys, and, and even then, if you you'll see, I mean, uh, we'll talk about it here. If Bonk doesn't come in and light the world on fire as a freshman or as a rookie. You know, people will turn on him. They do it pretty much on everybody. Um, they either announce their career is over, or they're never going to make it, or they just don't have it. People do that immediately. They, they People will do it with goaltenders. They'll do it with players, coaches. doesn't matter. And that's why we do the show is because I want people to remember these guys for when they inevitably come back up again. You know, they heard it here, and they don't have to go to, you know, a random Twitter user who will tell them the the value of a player without even seeing him. Yeah. So uh, with McClellan, you know, we don't know too much about him because we haven't seen him play too much, but the Flyers held on to him for a considerable amount of time, did not lose his rights. And it seems like he had a really good season in the NCAA. Well, here's the thing with McLaughlin. All right, so he's a pure playmaker, right? He's he's a he's a he's got good length, but he's he's a wiry he's a wiry kid. All right. But He's playing in a physical circuit, right? The NCHC for uh, North Dakota. Now, his numbers look phenomenal, but you have to take into consideration that he was a center for one of the best players in college in Jackson Blake, Jason Blake's kid, um, who went to Eden Prairie, by the way, and I think he scored the scored the winning goal for the title. But anyway, I digress. But um, anyway, so in their in their sophomore season. Uh, they were basically, basically arguably one of the best one, two punches in the country, uh, in terms of center wing combinations, the other wing, they, the, if I recall correctly, North Dakota rotated out guys, right? So you had like, um, uh, Dylan James, he was a Red Wings draft pick. He was also teammates with him in Sioux city in the USHL, uh, Reese Gaber is like a, a veteran guy for North Dakota, and uh, who was the other guy? I forgot. But anyway, the, the 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 no matter what other wing they put on that line, the Blake McLaughlin combo they were basically flawless in execution. They, I mean, I'm assuming when you have line mates like that, I'm assuming that there's like whether it's practice or off the ice, there's there's definitely chemistry. So you can't fault McLaughlin for having chemistry with an elite wing. And the thing about uh, Blake is he's not, uh, he's a Carolina pick, by the way. Um, The thing about Blake is he's not like a, just a finishing wing slamming home centering feeds. Like he is a, an elite level playmaker himself, but they have this kind of like, uh, you know, this anticipation where they know where they're going to be at all times. And it's, it's very impressive of, at a college level. So again, this is a seventh round pick and he's, he's basically, you know, delivering um, in, in more ways than, than just, let's say, dishing the buck to a talented linemate. 
What I do like is the fact that he's he's shooting the puck. He, he, he hates shooting the puck. He's a he's a pass first guy through and through. But I think when you play with a guy like Jackson Blake, like he's going to pass it back to you. And so we, we saw uh, uh, him more, I guess, confident in his own shot and his abilities. So, listen, he was like in the USHL his last year there. He was one of the top scorers. He was one of the top scorers this year, um, at least, uh, you know, set up men. Uh, in his conference, only a sophomore. He's got plenty of uh, time left in college. So, yeah, I mean, like you guys say, these are seven, six, seventh, fifth round, fifth, sixth, seventh round picks, and they're, they're one of the top yeah. players on their team in college, a legit Division One college powerhouse uh, program. Yeah, yeah so, I agree. What's not to like from a seventh round pick, um, especially too when you're seeing like a progression in his game. Um, it's not like he's kind of stagnating, like you said, Steve. Like he's kind of at least, you know, becoming more um, open to trying to shoot the puck um, when the opportunity arises, right? He goes from two goals in his um, freshman season with U of North Dakota to sophomore season um, up to 13 goals and then 39 points, obviously, in 39 games. So I just think for a seventh round pick, you can't really ask for much more um, in terms of what he's done so far. Yeah. Yeah. And th the only thing that I would be concerned with is like the, the jump to the AHL. And is it going to be too physical for him? Uh, I'm not going to say that you know he's handling the physicality of uh, college hockey like a champ. You know what I mean? He's definitely like a finesse type player, but he's he's not timid. But what what when he gets to the AHL, that always separates, for lack of a better term, the men from the boys. Where you uh, you're either going to go to the ECHL and as you uh, work on adding adding muscle, you're going to work on your game as well. We want to see you play, but then if you do that, you run the risk of the kid's confidence being killed. But again, this is a seventh round pick. If his if his goal is to make it to the NHL or get a contract and make a living out of this, he's uh, heading in the right direction. I love it, love it. So let's move on to another NCAA player and another uh, guy with the NHL pedigree. Uh, somebody who started off offensively very slow this year and then really turned it on, um, putting up 20 points in 36 games, nine goals, 11 assists as a 18 to 19 year old, uh, playing in the NCAA Cole Knubel, um, a guy who plays a, I would say different game than his father, but, uh, also a little smaller than his dad, but, uh, seems to be. You know, as a fourth round pick, seems to be kind of a project player and maybe somebody who will touch the NHL kind of in his, you know, mid 20s. Uh, he seems to be on track for that. But I'm really curious about, you know, what kind of season he had and what kind of turnaround he had. Well, when we talked about him last time, I said that he was suffering from bad puck luck, that the, the numbers were terrible. It was like one assist with a good three points in like 16 games. And you're yeah. like, wait, this is an NHL draft pick. And he's playing for a team that that really needed his help. Like you know, Notre Dame um, is usually a, a, a like a competitive team. They're never considered to be like a a perennial powerhouse in the Big Ten uh, since at least moving there. Um, so when I when I looked at their lineup, they had a couple of transfers. Uh, but I was like, you know what? Like they're going to need Knubel to be a, 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 like one of their go to guys, and it just wasn't working for him. But like I said last time, like he does more than just score. Well, he's the kind of player that can contribute without scoring. And, um, you know, hard worker. Uh, I would definitely classify him as more of a playmaker than a finisher. So they're in, uh, that's the, the difference between his father and Mike, who is a, like a net front presence, deflections, uh, you know, big body type. Whereas Cole is, is a playmaker, good along the boards, a uh, dog on a bone type, um, you know, uh, type of behavior when he's battling and he can make plays off of those battles. So uh, the, the, the Irish actually had a pretty good season and eh, they had a decent season while Canuba wasn't producing. And then being like early February, everything all went to hell. And so I think what happened was it gave the coaching staff an opportunity to, to change things around. They had to, they had no choice. They were losing every game and they actually changed his line mate so that he was on a line with uh, Moynihan well, I don't know if he's still a devil, if he's still devil's property, but he was actually he's Jack Hughes' line mate with the NTDP for a little bit. Uh, he transferred over from Providence and Landon Slaggart, uh, a Blackhawks pick who I like very much, uh, who I believe is the team captain. So he's on now the top line in the second half. And although the team isn't doing well, 
Now you're seeing Knubel's hard work being rewarded. And again, when he's not scoring, he's contributing in other areas. So uh, if he's not a 200-foot playmaker, he's going to be a a 200-foot mucker grinder checker type. So, you know, the fact that he closed out his freshman year on a high note, although the team didn't do well, it's now we know what to expect coming into next season. He did finish tied for fourth on the team in points. So even with the terrible... Yeah, that's a big turnaround considering that he was... He, he was, was at the bottom of the close team. to the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Earlier. So, yeah. I mean, we'll look to see. I, I think next year might be more indicative of, you know, an offensive production season. And I saw uh, Slaggard already played NHL games. So I assume that maybe he's going to be with the, the Blackhawks next year. They already gave him a nine game trial. Um, so they might be, you know, yeah, Slaggard. So, so he, he's a he's a really good prospect. He's another NTDP guy. Um, and so too is Moynihan. Uh, so you know, Moynihan is is not listed anymore as an NHL. Uh, all right, so 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 the so the Devils did all right. So he's basically a UDFA. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. he's a FA. He's he is 23 years old now, so I imagine he'll probably be a free agent, probably looking for a AHL deal. Next well, I was year. high on him too. I'm uh, that kind of sucked, but the Devils are deep, so yeah, know. yeah, but it's true. Um, but we'll see, we'll see. Maybe maybe it's somebody the Flyers look at. To be honest with you, that's usually uh, how it works. Yeah, because yeah, they're scouting the team, so. Uh, okay, next on the list is a player that um, really was not talked about at all. Nobody expected anything from him. Again, he's a former seventh-round pick. Notice there's a lot of pattern here. Uh, Santeri hmm. Sulku, who um, started heating up uh, considerably for Mestis uh, at one point, um, ended up with a pretty decent season, 26 points in 35 games, 17 goals, 9 assists. Seems to be a goal-scoring type. Uh, I believe had a pretty good year. Uh, I know Alex Appleyard, who's one of our, he used to write for the athletic. Uh, now I think he's writing for PLY, but um, you know, he does have a, a pretty good following. He does a really good job with the, uh, the, the foreign prospects, especially because um, he w- tends to watch a lot of their games. He seems to be relatively high on him. Um, what do you have to tell us about uh, Sulku? Yeah, he plays. Um, so he, he made the jump from the SM Sarge at the U20 circuit. And we talked about him too last time. So if I repeat myself, um, but hey, he's he's a shooter. He's a, he is like a big bomber. He's the guy that you put into the circle for the power play. And so uh, when he made the jump uh, to the uh, Mestis, the second division Mestis, which is basically like you know the fin- Finland's the SM league is elite leagues AHL, right? It's where a lot of the top prospects that I get obsessed with that never become anything. Like they all go there. And they play, and it's a pretty competitive league, too, pretty good goaltending as well. But he plays for a team, uh, Hermes or Her- Hermes. I think my wife would say it's, it's Hermes, but it's it's Her- <laughs> Hermes. And um, and he plays top six, like, uh, uh, minutes role. And um, uh, it, the one thing that surprised me is that he wasn't picked for any of the Finnish uh, U20 teams this year. Uh, and so he doesn't have really much of an international resume, but the thing about, uh, Hermes or Hermes, whatever it is, is that they're, they're having a, a Cinderella run in the Messi's playoffs right now. And he's actually having a better playoff than he had, uh, production wise in the regular season. I saw he scored a freaking cannon of a, he scored a, a wrist shot off an entry and it was just a dart. Um, so, uh, and every time I, you know, the few because the, the 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 Hermes um, uh, Twitter account, they, they I God bless them. They post video, actual video of the goals, not like of you know what's it called, uh, Photoshop like goal score. Like show me the yeah. damn video. Well, <laughs> they show me they show the videos and uh, and so he he's a prolific. Uh, I don't say prolific scorer as of yet because he's a rookie in in a an adult age uh, uh, league, but. You know, I think an SM League uh, promotion is in order if he keeps this up. So uh, the shot is is basically pro level. He 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 could beat NHL goalies with his shot yeah. right now, in my opinion. Well, that shot that you're referencing, Steve, um, the goal that you're talking about that he scored, like it's a perfectly placed shot. Essentially, walks in over the blue line. It's right between like the blocker and the pad, exactly where you'd want it to to beat a goalie. That's where the goal scorers are typically aiming. So. I mean, to see him score like that in such a high-pressure situation yeah. in the playoffs, that's obviously a really good sign. Uh, but I think the the main thing that's really encouraging is seventh-round pick, so you never really know what to expect. 
but he has a pretty good season in terms of production. But like you said, when the games really matter and the, and the chips are on the table, he has seven points in eight postseason games so far. So that just shows, right? Like you want those types of players that when the stakes rise, their game also rises. So I think from the Flyers perspective, once again, with the seven, seventh round picks, like what else can you really expect? Right? Like yeah. he's producing, um, as best as they could have probably hoped for uh, out of a guy you're picking in the seventh round. Yeah. Yeah. And in eight games, he's got three goals, four assists, seven points, and a plus six in the playoffs. He's also listed as six four. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a big buy. That I, I forgot yeah. to mention that. Like he's a uh, he's he just the, the way he manipulates the puck when he's getting wants to get into a shooting position. It's really impressive. Like uh, so, like shooting mechanics. It's something that probably the Flyers staff are looking at. And like yeah, holy the shot cow. release is pretty good. He's, he yeah. seems like the uh, type of guy that the Flyers will want to bring over when he's a little bit older. I mean, he's only 19 right now, but I think about it, Uli Lixel, uh, who's a player who had a lot of success in the SHL and then eventually made his way over to the Phantoms. And now is, you know, he is playing time in the NHL, but he's one of the Phantoms' best players. I mean, he's a point per game uh, this year. And uh, maybe this guy ends up taking a similar track. Maybe he won't ever be you know, a substantial player in the NHL. But again, seventh round pick, if he's able to compete at a high level in the AHL, that's still a huge win, um, especially at that size. We don't really have a lot of 6'4 goal scorers in our system. So um, that's nice. Most to see. teams don't, Yuri. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so let's move on to uh, a player that people were very high on. Um, again, he has not really surpassed his previous season statistically. Um, he played a little bit less games, but Devin Kaplan, a guy that a lot of people are very high on when he was drafted, um, big body, uh, right-handed, you know, right winger, um, has, looks to be kind of like a power forward grinder combination, um, who is just kind of a fierce competitor guy, a guy who probably fit really well with, uh, Tortorella's system and somebody that the Phantoms could probably use. He's already 20 years old. Um, he'll be 21 next January. Um, so what can you tell us about Kaplan and, uh, should we still be high on him? Yeah, you should still be high on him. I expected a big production spike out of him this year, but it looks like considering BU's the way their season ended last year and where they're at right now on the, on the, on the, on the verge of potentially winning a national title, uh, that. Like if you watched, you know, obviously I had to watch, but you play a ton this year because of Celebrini. Yeah. But, um, you know, so they also added Jack D Hughes, uh, the transfer from Northeastern freaking trader. But anyway, uh, so, so like, like there was only so much puck to go around. Like I like to say sometimes. So he was on a line, a pretty productive line with uh, a smaller finesse player named Jeremy Wilmer, who was on the NTDP before, and Zabine, the center. And I, I love the way that they played. Like it just seemed like Kaplan knew that that Wilmer was the was the playmaker extraordinaire and a really good offensive power uh, 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 type. Uh, and so he had to do the dirty work. But if Kaplan is not, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, doesn't lack skill, so it just I, I love the chemistry because they could also grind it out. You had like uh, almost like a Zuccarello type to uh, like a you know like a physical power forward, a power wing. In Kaplan's case. And what BU's done is, uh, and this is interesting, they've switched it up for the Frozen Four run, where they now, they moved Kaplan down to a line, which is like a smash mouth line with uh, Luke Tuck, a Montreal second round pick, former NTDP. Uh, uh, and then I forgot who the center is, the big kid. Uh, he's not, he's not uh, a, a draft pick, but uh, these, and so it's been effective. So Kaplan is the kind of guy that you want. You don't want him to score. If he does, it's a bonus. You want him to check, to hit, to smother, um, just to wear people down. And, and he still does that at a pretty high level. So although you would like to have seen a, a spike, um, maybe he plays it since he was only a sophomore this year, I, I think, right? He's a sophomore, not a – is he a junior or a sophomore? sophomore? I forgot. Sophomore. Sophomore. So he's got two years left in theory – uh, Celebrini is going to be gone. Um, but you know, if let's say, uh, like, let's say Cole Eisenman is going to be there next year, I believe, uh, there's going to be a bunch of guys going to be you a good, pretty good recruiting class. Maybe you'll see him like he earned his stripes 
as an underclassman in the checking role that now you're going to see him. But he has played occasionally on the power play, whatever. But I, I view him as like, and it's he's a wing too, which is odd that I view him as like a shutdown guy. But he's a he's a freaking shutdown guy. I mean, that's just how he plays. I love it. Yeah, he seems like a guy who maybe will excel more in the AHL um, than some other prospects coming over just with his physicality and size and um, yeah, he's a tough out. He's a really tough matchup, man. He really is. Yeah. And I, again, if you can define his role, um, then he has value. And if you can already see that type of role in the NHL, I mean, he doesn't, if he can be another Garrett Hathaway, right, um, for the Flyers, I think that's that's kind of a big win, uh, especially for a third round pick. That's kind yeah, of what grind, you look for. Yeah, grinder type role, can forecheck well. And it looks like, at least for the offensive opportunities, it's unfortunate that he hasn't been able to get as many um with bu but obviously i mean the scoring lines that they have rolling with celebrini it's kind of hard to place him in those positions um so it makes sense but i think for the flyers you have to hope that as a guy like celebrini leaves as more offensive opportunity becomes open with bu maybe he takes a step up next season right yeah yeah so next on the list, and this is a player I know you're high on already, Alex Yernick, uh, a guy who did have some World Junior, um, I guess, exposure this year, had a pretty good season, um, seems to be a goal-scoring winger, um, great skater from what I recall. We don't know too much about him because we haven't seen him play too much outside of the world stage. Seems to be a guy that you know might end up being more than his draft position. Again, another fourth-round pick. Um, that might be one of those kind of, you know, guaranteed pro players at, at a later draft spot. Um, but what can you tell us about the remainder of Sierra next se- season? Well, it's it, it's it, it's been an, an unfortunate season for him because he suffered a concussion at the World Juniors and uh, he missed a lot of time. And so he was playing um, in the Olsvenskin, which is, you know, the Swedish second division, like, you know, the mess is for, for, for Finland, the Olsvenskin is for Sweden. And uh, his team was freaking horrible, like historically bad, so bad. Uh, it was, it was Vastaras and Vester Vicks. I think it was Vester Vicks. Uh, they stunk. And yep. so, but he was one of their better players and he, he got a, plenty of ice time, got plenty of opportunity to score. And so he's kind of more of like a dual threat. I think, um, you know, his passing game is very good, very good passer, very good touch in all in any zone. Uh, and he is a very good skater. But he was out for a long time, and it's a head injury, so you have to worry about it. But he ended up coming back, and I. Uh, the, the thing is, though, is that Vastervix, it is Vastervix. They were they yes. were playing in the um in what they call the playout round in the Olsvenskin. and I don't know if it means relegation, but uh, they played Oster Sun to something, and he he actually played. He was back in action, so looked a little rusty. The one game I watched but he's back healthy and he's playing. And unfortunately though, they, they lost the series. I think they won the first two games and then they ended up losing four straight or something. So I don't know if they're getting relegated to like the freaking some weird league in Sweden. Um, but the, the, the key thing for him is to his health and, you know, he's back, you know, th- thankfully he came back to play. And then I saw something that he posted on his Instagram that he's taking a break from social media. Uh, it didn't say he was taking a break from playing. He just said he was taking a break from social media. So I don't know what that's related to. He just said, well, allows me to be in a better place. And again, you have a head injury. It's a pretty serious injury. Um, and it has to be, it can't be taken lightly, but, uh, what we should be looking at moving forward is a, does he get loaned out to the SHL? Cause I think he's ready. He's produced on a clip. That's uh, fairly impressive for the old Svenskin and B his, his, his health. You know, uh, you know the any uh, types of uh, after effects from the concussion. If he could play a full season and stay, stay healthy, but yeah, skill wise, uh, definitely an intriguing kid. Uh, and I, again, Flyers have a lot of shooters in their pool. I think a guy like Chernick it could definitely, you know, be a part of that because of the way he passed. Same thing with McLaughlin, like the way that they passed the puck. More of a playmaker, right? Obviously, every shooter needs a playmaker to get him the puck. I think with Cernick, like you said, Steve, that's. One of the main things, he has that concussion that's concerning. You don't really get to see him play for, um, you know, play there at the at the World Juniors uh, for Slovakia, which is kind of 
I mean, it's something people were looking forward to, I think, for Flyers fans to see kind of what his progress was was like. So I think that'll be a big thing, right? Next season, can he stay healthy the full season? Yeah. Uh, obviously, for young players, you know, losing any development time, that can be a crucial thing. So, Yeah, I don't think the Flyers will rush to get a player like him over. It's more of let him see what he can do overseas, and then, you know, if he's ready, bring him over. Um but he's an, he's a little an, bit in the SHL. Yeah, he's an intriguing he one. It's, it seems like a big boomer bust type of pick. Like, could end up being a, a really valuable pick. Also, could just end up being a European scorer. Um, and we, you know, we might not see much from him. But, but I you think know what? Those are those are the types of chances you want to take in, in the, fourth the fourth round. round right? Yeah, hundred swing. See what happens uh, with the kid if he can turn it into a player for you. Especially so. if he can skate. You know, the the really high end skaters. I think they're always worth taking a a run at especially in the fourth round. Um, okay, we have one more player, then we'll take a, then we'll transition to, um, to goaltenders, and then we'll do a quick drafting. Again, for those listening, we will do a full draft episode, pre-draft, and we'll do one post-draft too with Steve, um, just to you know focus more on that, because there's a lot to, to go through uh, when it comes to the draft, and we'll wait to actually get excited about that. Um, but Carter Southern, now this is a player... I, I'll be honest, I've not seen him play at all. Uh, statistically, I've only looked. I mean, he's got really good size. He's 200 pounds, 6'3". He's right-handed defender. Uh, clearly on a very impressive Portland Winterhawks team that just seems to be completely dominant. Um, yep. He was a plus 46 this year. Uh, 40 points in 66 games. Looks like he's not really playing a number one role for his team. There are some older players on the team. Um, but it looks like he probably will graduate into that uh, as he's yes. only 18 right now. Um, but again, another fifth round pick where I can't help but look just on paper. You know, is this a guy we should be excited about? Because that's a really good season, um, especially on a really good team. But is that a consequence of playing on a great team or is he more than that? Because he seems to be an offensive defenseman to some degree. Well, all right. So definitely you have to take the, the quality of the team into consideration. But. This is what I like about Southern is that he was always paired with Luca Cagnoni. Cagnoni is a kid that I loved. Ranked 90, him in the first round. points this year. I saw yeah, I, I loved him. Smaller, hard-shooting defenseman, right? So think Emil Andrea, but a little bit more dynamic and like just like game-changing. Um, and so I, I was a huge fan of Cagnoni, and that's why when, when, when uh, Southern was drafted, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely familiar with the kid because they were partnered. Uh, for a while. Uh, and then this season, it was the same thing. Why would you break up that pairing? The team is doing well. But then they added the kid, um, uh, Jug North. Uh, Jug North. Uh, I, I always think of the Ugnaughts from Empire Strikes Back. But yeah. Jug North <laughs> is, um, is a uh, offensive-minded defenseman who uh, was, I think, a Seattle draft pick. This guy is pure offense. Pure, pure offense. So now you got two like offensive my offensemen in Cagnoni and Jugnov. So I was like, well, wait a minute now. Like, is this going to impact the pairings? What's going to happen with Portland? How are they going to respond to this? And so he's kind of like moved around the lot, but instead of being paired with Cagnoni, he's paired mostly with Jugnov and he doesn't see a whole lot of power play time because those two guys, like I said, it's like freaking, you know, uh, Bobby Orr and Paul Coffey, <laughs> you know, in terms of the way they're producing this year. Uh, so, but he, he, he's done really well with the transition and listen, he's a big body. He skates really well. He's got a very good shot. Um, and the defensive play is very good. Like he, he's, he's improved a lot. I call, I consider him a project last year, but now, like you said, I want to see what he does when the other two guys graduate. I don't know if they're going to graduate this year, but again, you're looking at a kid who I don't think he'll ever be a number one. Uh, it would be nice to see what he could, uh, what he do uh, with that kind of role in the uh, CHL. Maybe it happens later on in the, in a place like the ECHL, or the AHL. But what I, the, the the my biggest takeaway out of his season thus far, from a production standpoint, is his production hasn't changed in the first half to the second half. The first half with one part, and the second half with you know multiple partners. <laughs> so um, you know, I, I think that you know. 6'3", 200 pound right shot defenseman who could skate uh, and have a big shot, put up points, be uh, used on the penalty kill, uh, use his reach to his advantage, uh, can be physical as well. Like, you know, perfect draft plus one season considering his position, 
his role and the and the situation surrounding his team. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he produced more this year than last year too, which the progress yeah. is there. Yeah, you see the progression. Facility. No, no problem. Um, I think Steve, one of the most interesting points you brought up is just the fact that. Uh, like you said, second half of the season, a bunch of different partners, but he seemed to not miss a beat and kind of adapt to that. Um, in Canada, like Sportsnet, um, the station, they'll do like uh, Canadian Hockey League, you know, game of the week. So I, I've seen him in a couple games in those game of the weeks. And what I noticed the most out of him, and it kind of was similar um, to a Flyers defenseman on the roster right now is just his ability to skate the puck up the ice, rush up the ice with the puck. Really, really good skating ability. He kind of reminded me of like a young Travis Sanheim, not to say that's something that he's going to become or anything, but yeah. similar body type. Um, I mean, the skating looks similar to me, so it's encouraging, right, to see a guy that you draft once again in the fifth round take another step forward. It seems like all these guys that the Flyers are drafting with these late picks after they've drafted them seem to be progressing versus kind of taking steps back. So that, that's, yeah, a positive it, that's a great point. And that, that, that's you couldn't ask for anything more when you don't have control complete control over them as in in the AHL or at the NHL level and you're trusting another coach another staff uh and the staff is so huge that clearly the, the kid deserves credit for that they deserve credit for not just getting drafted but it's very common we see a lot of players in other sports do this as well where they get drafted and they get the money and then everything you know it's, it's, it could be a domino effect in the, in the negative to, uh in the wrong direction so with all these kids we've talked about, have I said anything negative? I, 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 you know, is, is there be like, oh, he's been a huge disappointment. I'm not sugarcoating these kids. I'm not telling you that, you know, oh, Barky. Uh, no, these kids deserve, like I said, the only guy that I would say deserved a little bit of criticism, I guess you could say would be Knubel because he had a, 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 he didn't produce in the first half, but, you know, he bounced back and had a, had a, a strong second half. So good point. Like uh, these kids are just, they're, they're doing exactly what you would expect out of them. Yeah, and Sutherland is on no one's radar from a Flyers fan standpoint. So he's a guy who probably will come up in the conversation if he has a big year next year with extra added minutes. It could be a um, really promising pick uh, for a late-round pick because, again, the Flyers are looking for NHL players. They're building for the future. So this is exactly what we want to see, and so far the scouting department has done a really good job, um, especially with the mid- to late-round picks. Um in the, uh, you know, potential department. Yeah. All right. So just want to remind everybody, please like, and subscribe, hit the, uh, notification bell for notifications, follow us on Spotify and iTunes. Give us a rating there. All of that is incredibly helpful. Okay. Let's transition to goalies. We got three goalies that we want to talk about. Um, these are the only ones really in the prospect realm. One of which will be playing. I assume a couple games here for the phantoms, uh, and this is the big name, uh, somebody we've all been watching, uh, Alexei Kolosov. Uh, so he just came over. He signed the ELC uh, in the off season. Was loaned out for that um, for that entire season. That season ended. Uh, he had another successful year. Statistically, he had a better year last year. Um, but a guy who's on a track of a lot of these successful Russian goalies that are, that are in the NHL today: Sorokin, Shosturkin. They all kind of went on this path. I don't want to put him in that world. Um, I don't want to put that pressure on him, but it does seem like the Flyers have a good one in Kolosov, and we're finally going to get to look uh, get a look at him here in the AHL. But what can you tell us about him? That, um, you know, as far as his season and what what Flyers fans can expect. Uh, he's a money goalie, uh, and I say money goalie not like necessarily from the standpoint that he has the hardware to back it up. But he he's been able to like, you know, there are so many goalies who just don't steal games, right? Like you want them. To, and I guess we'll we'll get into one. I know I said we've been saying nothing but positive things about Fly's prospects. We're about to say something negative about one of them. Well, at least I will. But uh, you want your goalie to steal games. And the thing about Kolosov is even going back to the um, uh, playing for Belarus in the uh, men's worlds, right? Where like this guy is just capable, he has that ability. So my biggest takeaway from Kolosov has always been the KHL playoffs, where his team does not belong there. And this year they played Minsk. Uh, um, um, Minsk played Dinamo Moscow, one of the best teams in the league, and he 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 frustrates shooters. He does what he does. He's a frustrating guy. I'm assuming uh, you know if you're a, a pro level shooter, 
to square up against because he's always he the all the rebound control and glove hand whatever this guy is always squared up the right way he doesn't give you a lot to shoot at and he's not like like extremely playing outside the top of the crease he's an in the crease kind of goalie like most butterfly goalies are today but he just he just everything is sealed off and tight and he's a ba- he's a battler like you watch him fight uh, when there's a loose puck, so so uh, if you want to call it post save recovery or puck tracking, uh, whatever you want to call it, like w- when when there's a like the trench warfare in the low slot, the scramble like the top right? of the crease, you know, yeah, I mean he is just always like fighting, and he, he doesn't, he's just not, he's definitely not a lazy goalie, like he doesn't rely on like his size or he's not like methodical, like, I, and it's not like he's like like an Askarov where he's very like demonstrative and you could see like, you know, uh, it's just, everything is, is just done. Like, like you could just tell the competitiveness in him. He's a very competitive guy, but not in a, like to the point where he's out of control. He's just like a very controlled, uh, you know, uh, by the book kind of goalie. And he steals games. He's just, he's a, he's a game stealer. And that's what you want. Uh, I, I like goalies who steal games, 45 shots, He's going to stop 48, might not get the win, but he made the other team sweat. Well, you, that's important, too. Well, I'm sorry, Vasily, but it, do, it does seem that he has potential number one, yeah, you know, or number one potential at the NHL level just off of what he's done so far. It's obviously early. He's only 22 years old, but, you know, all signs point to a guy who's already been playing against men in a league that you really don't see young goaltenders playing in the KHL. I mean, I can't. And if I they mean, do, they're really good, and they move on to freaking the NHL. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah, the impressive ahead, part so. for me, um, Stephen Uribe. Just looking at his age, twenty-two years of age, and he already has what one, two, three um, seasons in the KHL, essentially with over twenty games played. Uh, like four, shut, four shutouts. Yeah. Four yeah. Shutouts. That's what I mean. What goalie do you see at age twenty-two that already has over one hundred twenty games? in the KHL like it's very it's very rare um and then also what you mentioned Steve like I've seen him play a few games this season um and just from looking at what he's done like the battling in the crease stands out the most to me like when there is traffic there um he's willing to like look through that fight through that that's a big thing with a goalie right like if that's a situation where you're not going to be able to battle through it's going to be tough um to transition i think to the nhl level where there's a lot more of that happening in front of you so to see him be able to do that at the khl level is encouraging and then if you look at how he reacts in the bigger moments like you said the bigger games like the playoffs in six playoff games okay sure um you know Minsk loses to to moscow obviously they're one of the better teams he has a, a two and four record but you look at his stats um he has a 925 save percentage in the playoffs, 221 goals against average. Those are up from what his regular season numbers were. So when the chips are really down, when it's all on the line, he's raising his level of play. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it translates for him at the AHL level um, and if he can get some games in before the end of the season for the Phantoms here. One thing that's, I mean, a positive is his club, um, you know, Dynamo Minsk, they actually play um, NHL regulation ice surface um, at their facilities. So th- so he won't actually have to really adjust much uh, to the NHL ice service, which which is pretty interesting. I didn't know that. I, um, know that did, I did some research on it, but just the fact that you won't have to kind of adjust to the angles, that's a huge thing for goalies, right? So I, I would imagine with that, they might probably get him into some games here to end the season for the Phantoms just due I, to that. I think for sure they're going to get him into a couple. I think the Phantoms still have 10 games left, if I remember correctly. He's 10 or 9 games left. He'll, he should get a look, but he's most likely going to be the starter for the Phantoms next year. Yeah, definitely. Um, and share the net with Peterson, who will be on his last contract with the Flyers, and good chance that he's probably going to be an AHL goalie for the remainder of his career. Um, all right, so we know about Kolosov. We got two left, and the next one, Igor Zavragin. Uh, this guy, by all metrics on paper, seems to be like an absolute steal for the Flyers in the third round. Uh, I don't know what this guy's ceiling is, but... You know, all signs pointed, I guess, similar to Kolosov, where this guy seems to be at least ahead of schedule. He's not playing against um, 
the same level of competition in the KHL, but his numbers are absolutely ridiculous um, and uh, seems to be a very difficult goalie to score on. We talked highly about him um, earlier on the on the other podcast, but what can you tell us at least about Zabragan's end of the season here? Well, I was a huge fan of his. Uh, I had him in my first round, uh, my preliminary first round after the 2022 draft. So when I was making my 2023 list, I had to put together that, you know, it was a very deep draft. I'm like, you know what? I think that this goal is going to be something special. Uh, he ended up going to the third round. I don't know how much of a Russian, the Russian factor played into that. I think it was a third round pick. Yeah. Um, yep. But the the thing about Zavragin, uh, he's like a lot like Spencer Knight. Like he was almost like he was designed in a lab and uh, mechanically, technically, he's per- he's almost perfect. Or well, they very few weaknesses. But the one thing that I, I'm upset about with him is that he should have been playing for Mamonte Yogri's MHL team this year as their number one uh, in the playoffs. It was a very good team this year. He played most of the season in the VHL, which is the second division. And he, th- that team, uh, Yugra or Yugri, whatever they are, they have like a 40,000 year old goalie. He's like, uh, uh, I forgot his name. He's been there forever. And so, yes, maybe he is a good mentor. Maybe I'm like, you know, shortchanging the guy and I'm criticizing him, but maybe he's a good mentor to half a Zevragin. And part of his success was being a backup to this, you know, veteran mainstay that they have in goal. But the MHL playoffs usually happens where all the teams send their best young players back down to the MHL to bulk up for a run. So you, you got the Ska 1946s. The local Yaroslavls, the uh, the Chaikas, which is of course where uh, it's where um, Salayev and Artamanov are playing right now. So I'm like, you know what, Zevragin, I want to see him uh, play full time in the playoffs as a number one. Even last year, he split time, and so this year, for whatever reason, they kept him up at the stupid VHL when he should have been at the MHL and played every game from a Monte Yugri. And what ended up happening? They lost in round. They got upset by Chaika uh, uh, in round, I think it was like round two or the whatever, the the round after the qualifying round. So, you know, I think this kid is ready for a, a legit full-time number one role. No backups, no nothing. Let this kid play 35, 40 games. Um, he's one of those kids that I want him in North America. Uh, you know, enough with Russia with him because every time I've been following this kid, they say, like Tretiak said uh, wonderful things about this kid, almost on an Askarov kind of a level. So the fact that we can't see this kid play in the in, in the international level because of the sanctions, the fact that he can't be a freaking full time number one at any level, uh, I'm getting I'm frustrated. If you can, in case you didn't know, so um, but yeah, he's he's um, he's a kid that we're all talking about the mature guys in the goaltending pipeline right now, the Fedotovs, the Kolosovs, the Ursins. They're they're battle tested to a degree, uh, you know, some different than others. But Zavragin, I think, is will be in that next wave. Like when when it's you got a contract issue, you can't sign all of them, or one guy's unhappy because of playing time, which is natural. You have the young guy Zavragin, who's probably going to just be happy uh, to be playing if uh, you know after all this uh, jerking him around down uh, in Russia. So yeah, and his playoff numbers were also. I mean, in five games, he was three and two of one point nine six. Uh, goals against, and then a .924 save percentage at the VHL. At the MHL, to your point, he had one win. Uh, yeah, with and a they shutout. played the kid Vol- 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 Volotkin, the, the the Canadian, and he and Zavragin is is not, Vol- Volokin. I'm sorry, Zavragin is the superior goalie. So I don't think there's anything wrong with sending a kid down and you know experiencing a championship run. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, and and uh, unfortunately, Vol- Volokin played the Canadian's prospect, and he he wasn't that great. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you look at the only game he played, he didn't give up a goal. It's kind of a strange. Move. It's so weird. Like, yeah. Hockey's weird sometimes the way that yeah. these prospects get jerked yeah, around. And... I, I, well, I saw that with Zavragin, right? He didn't even give up a goal and then didn't play him after that, which is strange. But, but... it was because he was with the VHL because he had to back up yeah. the freaking fossil. They probably don't know what to do with him. <laughs> Because he's probably too good for the MHL. That's what it's and seems they have like, too many yeah. goalies at the VHL. But again, you know, I, I think that's something that Sakatsky, that's his name. Vladimir well, the... Sakatsky. He's 35. Yeah. And he's yeah. playing in the VHL. Well, so that, he must and... really like he must really like the restaurants in the freaking Yuga area. Because <laughs> well, he doesn't the, want to go anywhere else. The thing is, I think we see a pattern a lot of time is that 
the benefit it's not that you can't develop in the KHL league but the benefit of the i guess North American leagues and maybe even the some of the other European leagues is that they will treat it more as a development cycle and in this yeah. case they didn't they kind of like well there are three best goalies and it's like well yeah but do what's right for the kid you know and his well, they don't care i don't think in that right. situation right but here they would right here like yeah. if he was they would, the absolutely. flyers they would send him down and let him play a long playoff run and play all the minutes um we've no, seen agreed. that with like bobby Brink. i can understand right? like one season doing it but like it just seems like if you're going to tout this kid now yeah. As a potential franchise goalie or like the future of Russian goaltending after Askarov, which is what they did. Yeah. You know, when Tretiak speaks, people listen. Yeah, you're, uh, especially when it comes to goalies. So. I still can't believe the Flyers managed to grab this guy in the third round. Yeah, it's a good pick, really good pick. I mean, the one positive to look at is um, for that, you know, Russian national team tournament coming up in May. Um, he actually got named uh, Zavrag into the list for the goalies. I don't know if he's okay. going to play. Yeah, but... he, yeah. I mean, that's that's a positive for him and hopefully gets into some game action in the tournament. Put it this way. Put it this way. If there was a WJC that Russia was allowed to participate in, he'd he would have played. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's unfortunate. That's There's a lot of Russian prox prospects that would have it would have been interesting to watch them in the World Juniors, oh, but yeah. also just interesting to see how it would have affected the tournament. I, I, well, I, now they're leaving Russia out of this new, the, the, the next uh, NHL four, four Nations tournament and the World uh, Cup, whatever they're stuff. doing. I think this is, I think it's an absolute joke that these leagues are being political. Well, it's these like, players, it's, I mean, they, it's not like they're the ones, you know, going to war It's here, not right? just so. that. Sports are supposed to <laughs> transcend politics. Yeah. And you're sure. allowing politics to leak into our sports. Even the Flyers played the Russian Red Army team when there was no, you know, peace between. They, like, had, they yeah. had nuclear missiles literally pointing at us, but we and still played still, them in hockey. Right. It's and like, and look, look, what, look, what, look what we got because of it. Look what Canada got because of it. The 72 Summit Series. Yeah. Historic. And we got 1980. And like, so th that's what I don't understand. But again, that's another podcast yeah, for another I, time. I, it's a complete mistake, on, uh, in my opinion. And I think they're they're handling it in, in an immature fashion so with lack of wisdom. And I, I I say that a lot, a lot about politics nowadays. And this is one of those examples where I'm like, be adults. Why, why am I being the adult? Why are you guys behaving like children? And I, that's what I see. If here. they let Russia into the, into the, if they added Russia to the mix, not only would we see Kucherov, one of the best players in the league and Panarin, one of the best players in the league, but we could see a potential Bedard, Mitch Kov Mitch match, Kov, a rematch, yeah. which what would not draw more eyes? Yeah. It's so it, crazy. It From a game, like to market the game perspective, right? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah, well, what do you think um, you're going to generate revenue for Russia's war machine off of a world tournament? No, like, I mean, if anything, you're going to probably, you know, hasten their, their, their path to the NHL or have players. I don't know. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I, I, I do not understand. Speaking it. of Kucherov, just to mention this, he just broke tonight his own record. Lightning franchise record uh, for more than 129 points in a season. So just what a season he's having, right? He's sick. <laughs> he absolutely. And sick. you know what? Some lucky, some lucky team is going to get if they if they finish as the, the wild card one. They're some lucky them in the first is round. Get that team in the first round. Yeah, yeah. yeah I do not envy that team. Uh, all right, let's get into our last player. And this is, I when you were saying it, I knew the player that you talked negatively about, a guy that the um, Flyers. And honestly, I, I get it. I mean, you just look at his stats and it seems like he was kind of pulled from the playoffs as well. Uh, in the playoffs, Carson Bjarnason had a 6.79 goals against average uh, and a 0.836 save percentage. Uh, he Not played great. two games in the playoffs. Again, his stats this year were a little bit better than last year. Uh, he was right at uh, three goals against uh, per game, but he did raise his save percentage to 0 0.907 which is not bad um his his record was 24 17 and 4 and he had two shutouts this is the guy the flyers are high on i mean they traded up in the draft to grab him so they see something in him he did look good at dev camp but that doesn't mean too much he's still very young but uh what can you tell us about carson bjarnison well you know we I, we talked about him last year about how uh he was getting beat up high a lot uh, uh, late last season in his draft year, and that it 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 impacted the way I viewed him, because I although Brandon wasn't like 
you know, a powerhouse contending type. They had some plenty of NHL draft picks. They were a playoff caliber team. And I felt like his final, like 10 to 12 games of the season were really bad. Uh, like bad starts, like mental stuff, losing is a disease, <laughs> you know, see the, see the, the, the team, uh, sports psychiatrist, whatever you need to do. It was that type of vibe that I was getting. So obviously this year, you know, he's drafted now. He has uh, new sets of eyes on him to give him guidance to player development staff in Philadelphia specifically. And he was playing, he, he was playing really well uh, up until the beginning of, uh, I guess, like February. And then since then, it's like the yips where he's, he's just getting beat from distance. And I don't like that. It's one thing to give up five goals when four of them are rebounds and they're put back and your defense isn't helping you out or your defensemen always screen you and you always got to fight through them. It's making your job more difficult. I don't like that. A, he's getting beat from distance and B, he's not stealing games. Like he's, this is a, a high profile kid in the WHL. And, and the reason I'm call me wrong if you want, but Carter Hart, Dustin Wolf, yeah, they played for Everett. Yeah, Everett was a freaking defensive-oriented team. But there were plenty of games where they saw a ton of rubber and they just stole games. And in case you were wondering, I am a big fan of goalies stealing games. That They don't have to steal every game, but there has to be a game, maybe two out of every five, whatever. You have to show you, you can do it, especially at that level, right? Yeah, where, where your team just doesn't have it. Three games and four nights long travel, whatever. And I don't like the fact that Bjornison, like he, he gets into these, these like stretches where he can't stop really anything and he can't be counted on. And even when he does have a good start to a game, he'll let in a bad goal. And you're like, Oh, like why, why, why that happened? So, um, yeah, I, I, again, I don't want to completely bash the kid. He's very young. We've seen um, players like uh, go through these stretches before. I mean, look at the NHL, how fans would always, oh, they trade the goalie, he stinks, and then they bounce back the next season. So, uh, you know, we we definitely have to be patient with him, but at some point, I mean, you have to wonder what the Flyers are telling him uh, when they're going over film and if there's yeah. any tweaks. Is it possible for a goalie like a pitcher to make a tweak and their delivery, like a pitcher's, like will change, uh, you know, their their motion or their release point, or a quarterback, same thing. Is it possible for a goalie to make a minor adjustment and become phenomenal? If it was that easy, we'd probably see more of them do it. But um, you know, unfortunately, he's the one prospect out of a, all the ones we've talked about today that you know is he's kind of like back to square one again, and you want to see uh, some kind of a rebound next season. It's very interesting that they traded up, took him at number 51, and then they took Zavragin after him. Yeah. Uh they've and they've hit home runs on their goalies. I mean, they got they obviously drafted Carter Hart. They they drafted Fedotov in the seventh round. They drafted Kolosov. Um, they've done a great job with goalies of late, and they were yeah. high enough on this guy to move up to trade for him. So I wonder what it is they saw in him to be like, hey, this is well, the guy. This is the goalie we want in this draft. What I mean, what it looks like to me, at least, I think from a technical perspective, maybe they thought there was a lot there to his game. But like from what you're kind of saying to me, Steve, what you've seen, it looks like last season, like you said, he kind of got into a funk where like uh, letting in a lot of bad goals, like the, maybe the body language, the attitude wasn't the greatest. And even this season, you're saying, okay, from distance, he's letting in a lot of, of goals from distance. Just... Um, I, I mean, the way I look at it with goalies, like it seems like it might be a confidence issue, like a little maybe like on the mental side of things where he just doesn't have the confidence to stop those pucks because shots from distance, those are supposed to be, you know, easy saves from a goaltender as long as you can see it. Right. So they they might consider bringing him over early and having and developing him in the ECHL uh, slash AHL at some point if they don't feel his development, because I, I can't see them giving up on a second round pick goaltender. That they yeah. moved up. Well, to trade it for. looks like Zavragin might have already maybe surpassed them on their the Flyers depth chart potentially. If you just look at the progression, like what do you think, Steve? Do you think for Bjarnason it's more of a mental thing versus the actual physical tools for him? Um, I don't know. It's definitely not physical because he has the gifts. He's he's like you know he's he's fairly uh, well respected in goalie circles from a young age. 
So maybe it's a, a, a the, the consider uh, the uh, the situation is, is pressure. Yeah, that you know you've been tabbed as uh not that he's been like you know he was considered to be like a savior like uh, he did start know. early to your point it looks like he was playing at sixteen in the WHL. Yeah. So and and I think that you know when you look at the um the WHL is not really viewed as uh, as an offense friendly league. Right. It's always well, at least it used to be. But now we're seeing that kind of change a little bit. Um, but, he, you know, he's in 05. And he, so he's in line to be you would think he would be Canada's number one at the World Juniors. That when when Canada's creating their, their 2025 World Junior roster, that at some point Hockey Canada said, either it be two years ago or last year, that, hey, in 05, we're going to have Bjornison. And because, you know, I don't know if, if you guys uh, are tracking this like trend with Canadian goalies now, but it's a little it's, it's odd that Canada is not developing no, elite they goalies like yeah. they used to. It's <laughs> crazy how it's not happening, even even on the French Canadian side. Um, and so maybe that changes. Uh, who knows? But I think the issues we're seeing in goaltending right now in the NHL and, and it's an issue like freaking goalies are driving me nuts. In the NHL, um, but like when you do, let's say your Olympic roster for Canada, who's going to be in goal? You, know, you look at you look at and then compare that to what you're seeing in Sweden, what you'll see for the for the Czechs, what you'll There's see. Been for, a drop off for Canadian goaltending for yeah, the it's it's, it's an years. odd development. So I'm 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 wondering why I can't really explain why, but I'm also from a, from a Bjornison's uh, from the Bjorn, uh, Bjornison point of view, like. This is a this next season is going to be a huge season for him because if he has just a, a dominant start, then he's going to be a shoo-in to be their number one. But you know, I mean, I, I think wasn't this year's World Junior team had the the draft minus one kid, yeah, right? They did. So they didn't even have Bjornison on the team, and where you would think that he would have made, I don't know if they, he I, wasn't on the team at all. No, yeah, so. Again, it's world junior is not the end a all... little telling, actually, right? Just based on his performance, not the end all be all, though. So I don't want to become that guy who's a hypocrite and says, "Oh, the world juniors matter," but little tiny, like it's all starting to kind of like if you piece it all together, it's trying to make a little bit of sense that that this young man has has things to correct. Um, I, I definitely see a, a future for him, but now the the bigger issue out of among forget about where he was drafted, the bigger issue is going to be the competition in the pipeline. Because now, you know, Fedotov, goalies yeah. could be prime at 35. So fe between Fedotov, Kolosov, Zavragin, Ursan, where exactly does Bjornsson fit in? And so we, we might be looking at a, a, like a long-term situation here. Yeah, I, I would say so. Okay, that's it for the players. That was awesome. Let's, uh, let's do just a quick conversation on the draft. So the Flyers sure. have four draft picks. Assumingly, four draft picks could be three if uh, Columbus chooses to move that second round pick to next year. I don't know if they're going to do that, but right now on paper, the Flyers have four draft picks within the first two rounds. Um, Does that count? The uh, did they make a decision on the com uh, co uh, the com uh, compensatory pick on O'Brien? O'Brien, yeah. So they, I mean, uh, cap friendly has it has the Flyers listed with the the pick fifty first so, overall, I think, or something like that. Uh, I don't know. If Let's see. What it's was not he listed on here? But yeah, he was 19th overall, so it should be 51. Okay, so yeah, that's All probably right. the case. Yeah. So yeah. So and again, the Flyers will be picking anywhere between what 16 to. Oh, no, who knows? 20. Now with the way the freaking yeah. East is. <laughs> uh, also, also true. It's wide open. Um, and then they'll have the maybe you know bottom five pick in the first round with Florida's pick. Yeah, they'll have the fifty-one, and then they'll have Columbus's, which might be above fifty-one. I'm, I'm I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but uh, still, four picks in the early parts of the draft. Um, from what I understand, this is not the deepest draft, um, but there are high-end players available. Um, what do you think are some options for the Flyers? Um, again, they kind of need everything to some degree. Um, because they don't really have like something that they're truly lacking outside of like high end, high end talent. But number one center is top of everybody's mind. I don't know if that's going to be available for them. Um, but what could the Flyers look at uh, within those couple couple draft uh, rounds? 
Well, it's a, it's a deep draft for defensemen. Uh, probably one of the deepest we've seen since 2018. Okay. Where we had, I think, 14 defensemen taken in round one. Uh, I believe six in the top 12 or 13, maybe five. So we're probably going to see that this year. All right. I know we talk about the 2012 draft with all the defensemen going in round one, the Troopers and the Lynn Holmes and the Morgan Rileys, et cetera. Um, this draft, though, what, what what what's really keeping me up at night is what will teams do uh, picking in the top half because of the, 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 I guess, the riches, the defense riches. Whereas you're going to have first caliber defensemen in the bottom middle to late second round, I think. Like in a, like last year was not a big draft for defensemen. You still saw a couple go early. So what I mean by all this is that if that happens, if, if teams just say we're Google for uh, Gaga, Gaga for um, a defenseman and all those teams, the San Jose's, well, obviously Celebrini is going to go first overall, but uh, after San Jose, uh, you know, the Arizonas, the Anaheims, et cetera. If they just start going boom, 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 defense, 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 which would be in line with central scouting's rankings, then you're going to have a whole bunch of high-end forwards slip to the middle. So although my top 10 is incredibly forward heavy, and I actually started pushing defensemen down, uh, the Flyers may have a chance to Grab like I wouldn't say like a Berkeley Catton because he'll be gone early. The center for um, Spokane. Same thing with Consta Hellenius, the Finnish kid. They're going to be two of the, two of the first centers off the board. Um, Caden Lindstrom, very high in Central Scouting's ranking, um, but he had injury issues. More of a goal scoring uh, center than a playmaker. I don't really see him deliver any high end passes, although he can do it at least into the middle of the ice. Uh, but he's an elite stick handler for a big kid who could skate and stick handle. I think that's why people might be obsessed with Lindstrom. Uh, but after that, you have a whole bunch of wings who uh, who might slip down, right? Uh, Trevor Connolly, right? The issue with the... The, the, the off-ice stuff. Yeah. The off-ice stuff, right? Uh, that he might slip. So do the Flyers take a gamble on him? Even though he's a wing, he plays like a center. The other issue too, uh, the other uh, player who might slip down is um, uh, uh, Cole Iserman, but he's not a center, but he's an elite goal scorer. I was going to ask you, Steve, what do you think on Iserman? Like, do you think he'll fall into the mid teens or? Yeah, yeah. I think he's going to fall because his game is too one dimensional. Um, you know, what he does at the U18 Worlds is really his last shot. I mean, in tournament play, he's he has not been good beyond goal scoring. And when he does score goals, uh, it's like during garbage time. I mean, there are some exceptions to that. He's always beaver tapping. He wants the puck all the time. Some say it was his center. You got to, that shouldn't be the case with an elite goal scorer. Elite goal scorer should kind of have you playing as their center. And I'm, I'm me, uh, being on the other and uh, I being on the other wing. Uh, and, um, and you know, they, they won't have issues scoring. So I think, that, so a guy like Iserman, who I had number one in my preseason, is now looking at maybe a 10 to 12 to 15. So again, if you have, let's say, five defensemen in the top seven, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, Dickinson, Parekh, Yakimchuk, uh, Zeev Boyum, yeah. and Levshinov, uh, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. Uh, if those guys are gone uh, early, you're going to have a forward heavy middle of the pack. And that's where the Flyers can center on kids who are very excited, right? Uh, Sasha Boisvert is a big center with a lot of skill playing in the USHL. Um, he's like a more dynamic version of Cutter Gauthier. Uh, I would say there are some similarities there, except Boisvert isn't, I guess, as as physical or as intimidating as, as Gauthier might have been. But he's a very high-end talent with the puck especially with the way he stick handles. Yeah, I remember, Steve, you were really high on him. Boy, oh, there. yeah, like, very high on has him. Has he finished the season out pretty strongly here for, in the USHL? Yeah, for Muskegon, yeah. Uh, I haven't caught uh, any of the USHL playoffs uh, yet, but, you know, uh, I, I think I think he's old enough to play for Canada at the U18 Worlds. Let me check. Uh, if, if he plays, is he a late birthday? No, he's in 06. So if he plays for Canada at the U18 Worlds, it could be like, what one might consider to be a coming out party, and that would boost him even higher. But I, I'm I'm more higher on him than the average, I guess, uh, ranking. But um, the other the other kids, if you want to look at it like from a flyer standpoint, 
is is uh, uh, Tarek uh, Paraskak. Uh, pa- I'm sorry, uh, Paraskak from uh, the WHL, who's like a dynamic score, uh, all energy, uh, high end skill. They they had him on the top line at the um, uh, CHL top prospects game with uh, I believe Tijaginla, who's another kid I think is going to go early as well. So the Flyers will miss out on him. Um, um, looks really good again. Yeah, yeah. Ginla's a, a mature player as well. Uh, and then Liam Greentree, though, he's a wing. The Flyers don't need wings, but between him, Brent said knee guard, the physical kid playing in the Swedish league, uh, and uh, who was the other guy? Uh, is it Beckett Seneca? Sinek? But Beckett Seneca, like oh, those Sinek, are, I Seneca, think, bad butcher by me, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like th- those guys are like legit in your face. We're gonna make life miserable for you, type players. And so the Flyers, it's all about culture. And again, so uh, listen, Flyers have a lot of options. But I-, I-, I wanted them to use this segment. I wanted to just say that if you're a Flyers fan and you don't win the lottery and you're picking, just probably you're priced out of the elite defenseman range, like the the top elite uh, defenseman range. That you're more than likely going to get a an Oliver another Oliver Bonk type option where he's not one of the best in the class in terms of top ten potential, but might end up turn out to be one of the better ones when all is said and done. That sounds pretty good. And right now, honestly, I have no dire- no idea of where the Flyers might just go pure best player available. You it's know, possible. Yeah. Like, we we always think that they go by position, but a lot of these guys are not going to touch the NHL ice for a while, right? Like I don't really see the Flyers drafting a guy who makes the NHL in the next year. Um, yeah. So it you know I I think they have some holes to fill, but you know Vasily and I both talked about the opportunity to move up in the draft too, right? They have two first round picks well, that package them to move up, move a first and a second to move up. That's what that was my thought. I want to see maybe just on the last kind of comment here steve what you think um just in terms of the flyers like they're gonna have four first round picks over the next two drafts here um do you think maybe they might make a trade to try to move up um if they find like hey we want to you know try to get one of uh those high-end guys instead of maybe the middle of the road type of players in the first round i it it all depends and i'm not trying to uh, avoid the question uh, no, first of all, the number, answer we're so far away, right? First of all, number <laughs> one, teams teams rarely do it to begin with. Right. So true. we fans always talk about it, like, oh, just trade up, but it's not the NFL draft. Like the the, yeah, the, it's rare. the teams know that n- only one or two of these kids will play in the NHL within the next year or two. Everybody else is like three to four years away from being an impact player. Uh, the other issue uh, is that I'm seeing with the Flyers. It's not really an issue. It's actually a, a luxury. Is that we don't know what direction this team is heading in, in terms of like at the NHL level, like what, what is Keith Jones and Briere's long-term strategy? Are yeah. they going to just keep riding out this torts worker, worker B, you know, a bunch of second and third line types, or are they like, Hey, like cap space, we got some dead space. We're going to get rid of soon. Let's weaponize some of our UFAs. Although we don't have a lot, you got a connect knee extension coming up. Could he be in play? Like, what is the vision? Is this like, we're going to rebuild, keep rebuilding? Or is it like, all right, we've seen what we've seen. Rebuild is over. Let's go out. Let's get rid of uh, what we can, buy people out. Or then let's start bringing in uh, veterans and make us even more competitive because it looks like the Eastern Conference might be shifting and it's right for the taking. And if that's the case, you might want to save those first round picks for the trade deadline. And then and again, we're getting into some, long-term strategic stuff now, but as far as like trading up, it always takes two to tango, not to sound cliche, but that's just the, that's the God's no, honest no, truth. It's, it's true. And like you said, right. Historically, like I think over the last 20 years, there's been like one or two times the team's moved up into the top 10. It's very rare, but it'll be interesting yeah. to see what happens. They have a lot of picks. So yeah, my, yeah. my speculation around that, I just, you know, we brought this up before is that Tortorella is paying attention to Mishkov. Right. Like he named the kid already. The kid is, let's just say, two years away, you know, beyond the season from joining the Flyers. If you look at the way they bought players out and the retention that they've held on, it's about two years. I think that all signs point that the Flyers plan on turning the ship into 
we are now going to start actually taking the playoffs seriously, potentially even moving some assets to make the playoffs in about two years. I think if they do better throughout that, maybe the the timeline will change. This year did not move that, right? Trading Sean Walker at the trade deadline proves that, right? They they sacrificed one of their better defensemen to get a first-round pick. Like, I think if you look at their draft picks, drafting two first-round picks the next three years to attempt to speed that up. And look, that could shift back, but all signs, in my opinion, point to two more years of rebuilding the next year and the one beyond that. And then when Mitch Cobb comes over here, they want to be ready for that. When that high end elite player comes here, I think they want the pieces around that ready. They have the goalies that are in that age group, right? With Arison being 24, they have Kolosov at 22. They have Fedotov at 27. They have a bunch of defensemen who are building up with Drysdale, York, Bonk. I think they really look about two years from being, taken seriously that could shift but i imagine that if they're penciling it in it's in two years and you look at the buyouts that they have the retention on Hayes, it lines Hayes up with three, that yeah. yeah it lines up with about two maximum three years um and i think they will probably hesitate from taking on any salary like dead weight beyond two years maybe three years down the line so that's kind of what i see just from you know everything that they're willing to gamble on so i would say about two two years is probably a safe bet. When Mitchkov comes here is when they're going to be like, well, we need a centerman to play with Mitchkov, right? Because I always bring it up, you know, with John LeClaire here for the Flyers, right? Like, yeah, John LeClaire was a three times 50 goal scorer, but he did that playing with Eric Lindros, right? Like we had Carter Hard or um, Jeff Carter playing here. He's a goal scorer, but he was playing with Mike Richards. He was playing with uh, Claude Giroux, right? Like you need the additional talent around that guy and that's why they're oh, keeping you have to supplement the time right. right that's why they're keeping connect they're probably keeping frost they're keeping tippet you know they're keeping Farabee. they're going to keep all these guys and then hope to insert that high-end player to kind of elevate them to the next level and be ready for that that's what i i think the signs indicate but we'll see i could be wrong about that i mean it looks like it because of their, their inactivity right. um you know uh in acquiring that that the cap is probably and should be a major consideration. So, um, you know, but look at Detroit. Now, that's the reason why I brought up the Flyers is the Detroit has improved every year on the Eisenman, but they haven't made the playoffs. And you would think that drafting 10 to 12 kids a year between what, 2016 and 2021, that the Red Wings you see today are mostly kids. And it was like half kids, you know, but no, actually Eisenman's solution to the, the Eisen plan was let's go out and just get a ton of UFA and veterans, and that's who dominate that lineup outside of a couple of uh, notable names uh, that they home, uh, homegrown yeah. names. So I'm just I'm wondering, like, when the, the ownership is going to be like, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with the way things are going because I'm I was a little surprised that they didn't do anything at the deadline when they had draft capital that they didn't say, you know what, well, let's just uh, throw a third round pick here or there, get a goalie, get something. Uh, they didn't, they, they, you know, it was the opposite. So, uh, to, to, to your point, you it's probably why you're right. It's like yeah. they, they are yeah, they're sticking to the plan, right? Of, of there's a plan, the ownership is bought in and they're doing it. But I'm wondering if, like, one more season of being this competitive, then the fans will be like, what the hell? Okay, right. can we pivot please? next offseason, right? That, add, add some UFAs potentially as some money frees up, maybe. And it also Something. depends who's available, right? Like, you yeah, hear the yeah. name Trevor Zegers around there. Like, if the Flyers can add a guy in his mid 20s, they're going to look to that, right? Yeah. If, if it's a guy who's 30 plus, probably not. But well, it doesn't no, make no, sense no. for the window, right? right? Like, they, you want to add a guy who, like you said, Yareev, is essentially gonna still be an impact guy when a Matt Mitchkov gets here. That's obviously who they're going to be trying to build around going forward. You don't well, want to trade for guys that aren't going to, you know, potentially have an impact when he arrives. A guy like a Zegris, it's a perfect age, right? Mid twenties type player. Yeah. And um, there's no other player that is below the NHL or even AHL. I, I, Tortorella does not care about anybody in the AHL or the NHL. He doesn't bring them up at all. But he specifically, excuse me, specifically brought up Mitchkov. That means he is eyeing Mitchkov, right? He is aware, and that tells me everything I need to know about Mitchkov. If there is 
John Tortorella is paying attention to a prospect in Russia that there there is some plan around yeah. him. And and again, I'm not an expert, but everything I see from this kid is he's on a generational track statistically. I see no real big gap between him and Bedard, and he's going to come over here being not 18 years old, right, playing against men already. You can pencil that in as now we have a star player. We have a bunch of good players beyond that. We've learned how to play defense. We have pretty good goaltending, assumingly that these goaltending goes well. We can be enough to be a serious playoff team. Maybe not a Stanley Cup contender when he gets here, but it'll be that that ne- that piece that will pull you up a level. Because I always say, like you're not you're not going to turn into a Stanley Cup team because he added one player. But if you're already a good team and you add a player of that level, you know a, a generational talent, yeah, a franchise take you to the player, next level. That's exactly. where you can become a Stanley Cup contender. If you have a good team and you're adding a superstar. Now you've hit another level. Um and yeah. I think I think the Rangers did a great job with Panarin, right? Like they were already a good team, they rebuilt really quickly, but you know, adding Panarin kind of elevated that entire team. It's a full team of good players, but you know, adding a 100-point player makes you a Stanley Cup contender every year. Um where without him maybe they're just, you know, maybe they're not Well, the goalie too. One. The goalie helped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one's Shuster harder to predict. Helps. That one's harder to predict though. <laughs> Right, like, yeah, it's hard to predict that a goalie is going to be awesome in the NHL. Um, and I, you know, that one I think they, I don't, I don't want to say they got lucky because he's obviously they knew he was going to be good, but I didn't think they know that he'd be generationally good. That's like I feel like you always take that with a hint of salt with with goalies. Yeah, sure. All right, this was an awesome episode. We went really long, um, as I expected. Uh, Steve, anything you want to leave our audience with? Anything you want to let them know you're working on? Um, yeah, so my substack is at the draft analyst.substack.com. Uh, uh, I owe my, my free subscribers uh, a mock draft and a ranking. The mock draft, you know, I, the, the stupid standings have been killing me because I, I hate doing mock drafts and the like, standings like turn out to be completely different. Right. And usually in the past, we've seen this time of year, we know who's not making it, and we know who's in. Now we really have no clue outside of like seven or eight teams, and they're all contenders. It's weird. Um, but, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, from that point forward, it's just going to be a lot of breaking down, uh, breakdowns of every region, every league, um, just in, in less focus on NHL prospects and way more focus on the draft itself. If the flyers, unfortunately, uh, if they miss the playoffs and they're in the lottery, uh, I'll be ready for you guys. I'll have all types of, um, you know, uh, you know, lottery packages to, give people an idea of what to expect, but, uh, um, yeah, that's about it. You know, it's just, this is the time I start writing my draft guide. I already started writing it, but I mean, this is the next two and a half months is like just basically catching up and, uh, refining and watching kids I hadn't seen yet. And it, it was a lot. Central scouting's list just, it was 475 deep. Uh, so it did made my a kids to watch dude. a lot. Of, usually <laughs> I, I watch that many, maybe more, but in terms of like kids that actually have legit draft potential, I'm like, great, thanks, Central Scouting. Now it's going to be like a 500 freaking. They got to write 500 scouting reports. So less of a focus this year on NHL teams and NHL prospects. Way more focus on the draft, which is what I I did in the beginning. So uh, yeah, excited, busy oh, time, but exciting for uh, awesome. excited for it. Yeah, and excited to have you on for the pre-draft show. Um, I always get so fired up for the draft, no matter where we pick. So. Um, yeah, it's in Vegas this year. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Uh, hopefully, can make it out there. And we'll yeah, get some on the ground uh, flyers, nitty gritty coverage. We'll see what we can that would do. Be nice, Vasily. Anything you want to leave our audience with? Uh, not too much. Um, we're you know gonna continue to have coverage um, leading up to the end of the season. Obviously, lots of articles on flyersnittygritty.com just surrounding the team, and hopefully, we get to see um, some playoff action here. But we'll uh, have to see how the remainder of the year. Uh, Kind of let's, off. let's hope and and next week we have uh jason coming on right confirmed yeah we got jason mertitis uh from uh who works for the flyers um uh, and uh does the flyers daily podcast so that'll be a great show as well and, and yeah. we're excited for that one but just want to thank you again for coming on steve it's always you know wonderful to talk to you and, and talk hockey with you and we, we appreciate your time oh likewise guys always 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 a pleasure and yeah uh you know 
glad glad to uh to come on here and like i said two and a half hours not a big deal we could do yeah. it for five if we needed to yeah it's <laughs> it's a it's a pleasure maybe around the draft we will especially <laughs> post draft if there's uh some good stories to talk about i'm sure there will be um again steve thank you so much i just Echoing what uh, Vasily said, you are the man. Uh, love that you're coming on here. Our audience loves you. So having on having you on here is always a pleasure. So thank you so much, man. Likewise. And uh, just a reminder to everybody, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell for notifications, follow us on iTunes and Spotify, give us a rating there if you can. All that is a tremendous help. And again, shout out to our sponsors, Jim Stakes of 4th and South. Again, they'll be open May 1st. And Public Summit Adjusters, 215-752-0560. All right, we're going to wrap this one up. Thank you all if you made it so far to the end of the episode. We really appreciate everything, the views, the subscribe, the subscriptions, the follows, all of that is amazing. Thank you all so much. We love you. And remember, always stay 